Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA Live 201 episode. Look, we got it right because of Dino. Thank you, Dino. <laughs> Thank you for paying attention better than I was, which is uh, very, very kind of you. Uh, so what do we have to say today? Start the things off with some important information, right? First, if you're new to the show and you want to get my attention or talk to me, ask me a question, let me know you're talking to me and not each other, please start the question with the question mark first or the subject. Uh, also, if you're uh, listening on the podcast, uh, thank you. And um, I don't know what else to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> if you're watching uh, the replay on YouTube, you can go to the timestamps for some of the subjects that we talked about or questions and uh, some of the stuff that maybe you know, kind of we talked about for any length of time. All right. That all being said, woo, get all that out. That was a lot. <laughs> okay, so as you can tell from the title, we already have a subject to talk about. It's uh, used guitar prices are out of control, but should we still buy? I actually had uh, two experiences this week, and that's why I want to talk about this subject. subject. It's something that relates to me and probably relates to you, maybe. And uh, I already see we have some questions. As you guys know, I go in early and we grab some of the questions, especially the first question. Today's first question is really funny. It's from James. And James says, am I first? James, you were first. <laughs> Thank you for the easiest question I've ever had to answer on this channel. Uh, I don't know if there's an easy answer prize. Although I would tell you this, James, if, anyone, if you ever get three wish wishes from a genie, a genie? Did I say genie? If you ever get three wishes from a genie, please think first before that first question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you, James. I just loved it. It was great. Uh, the next question came from Daniel. Daniel says uh, that he did a super chat last week and it got ignored. Um, Daniel's super, uh, question last week uh, was about finishes. Uh, it was actually about finishes with uh, the difference between the nitro finishes in Fender and Gibson. And I'm 90% sure, but not 100% sure, that is one of the first questions we talked about last week. So it might have thrown you off because we talked about it really, really fast. So it hit it hit fast. On that note, although we did miss a question uh, last week, and it was from Maddie Two Hats. That was the super chat that I did detect that we didn't catch. I try to, if I miss a super chat, like I said, I'll pen it, throw it over, and try to bring it in next week. He says, I got a Takai Gold Top Les Paul this week. Loving it. Have you tried these? Uh, thanks for all you do. Phil, you rock. Thank you, Maddie Two Hats. You rock because one, I like your name. <laughs> try, trust me, all week I've been, why does he have two hats? <laughs> why not three? Why not one? What a weird... Well, we're not hats and why a sign-on. Sign-ons are kind of fun that way. Anyways, that being said, uh, yeah, I've, of course, I've played to Tokai guitars before. Uh, I like them, Main Japan guitars. Some of them are kind of, you know, plywood, not so great. There's there's those out there. Don't get me wrong. But most of the ones I put my hands on have been fantastic. I like them. Uh, Tokai, Tokai would be one of the cool, uh, like, Edwards, uh, FGN, uh, those are cool made in Japan guitars that I think are cool that you can get for a good price. <laughs> we used to say a steal. Those days are gone, and we'll get into that. And uh, but um, yeah, good stuff. I, I like I said, uh, good good score basically. Um, so so there's that. And uh, there you go. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can add to that. Um, that's a good segue into the used guitar topic. Used guitars, so what ha what prompted all this was last week, and I, for I forgot the name of the viewer, I apologize. Uh, may I found it. It's Street Songs. <laughs> See, it was easy. Street Songs brought up a, uh, a comment last week that they paid $600 or are about to pay $600 Canadian for a 2018 used made in Mexico Strat. I polled you, the audience, asking if that was too much. Uh, and uh, I was wrong. I thought the new ones were $650, and somebody actually put in the comments, I think this for $750 US now. Anyways, the importance of this discussion was, after polling you guys, the majority of you said that was too much money for a used Mexican Strat, made in Mexico Strat. After going online and looking, that looked like that was actually not only fair market at the time, fair meaning averaged of the prices available, it's actually seemed a little low in some cases. Some prices I found made Mexico Strat. People are getting nuts, man. Now, first, I'd like to point out, we're not going to pull up any prices or, or, uh, or uh, auctions on Reverb. Why? Because I believe everyone has the right, the God-given right, to post whatever price they want on whatever they want to sell it for. 
I think that's the buyer's mistake to assume that a seller wants to sell something. I understand the mistake, don't get me wrong, because it seems crazy. Why would a seller not want to sell something? But sometimes it's fishing. Sometimes they just like, I'll sell it if somebody will give me this insane price. There's all kinds of reasons why people sell stuff. It's definitely not always to pay the bills. So, um, so I don't critique anyone that way. So if somebody puts, you know, five thousand dollars on a guitar that's worth three hundred dollars, well, you know, let them twiddle their thumbs forever while it never sales. <laughs> sales, uh, you know, and hopefully no one is silly enough or are naive enough to pay that crazy price. Or if they are, I've paid over market value sometimes on a guitar, and it's just because I wanted it. It was what I wanted. The person was pretty hard on the price. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to make your own decisions. We're all grown-ups here, I hope. So, anyways, all that being said, the prices are crazy. And here's why I say that. Uh, first of all, I decided for some reason that I can't really kind of quantify, so I can't tell you, I decided I wanted a GNL Tele again. I have a GNL Tele, an ASAT double humbucker. I wanted an actual Tele. Actually, really what it was, I really wanted a blonde uh, sorry, butterscotch telly again. And I guess uh, Fender is in play on that too. But I wanted a butterscotch telecaster. And a very specific one too. I prefer rosewood fretboards. I like maple fretboards, but I prefer rosewood. And for some reason, I wanted a butterscotch telly with a rosewood fretboard. It's a very specific thing to want. Because as you guys know, if you're Fender players or people who like Fender, you know that Fender doesn't do that. Not ever, just not not rarely, very rarely. So, anyways, I uh, I uh, I found GNLs. Here's what made me laugh, and this is what I want to share with you. I found a brand new one for one thousand six hundred and fifty dollars shipped, and it actually had some cool features like an arm carve and a belly carve, and I was really really dialed in on this guitar. I was like, wow, this is really cool. It's a new one, and <laughs> Uh, so, of course, that's a lot of money, and when I how I buy guitars, like a lot of you is, something has to go for something to come in, so you're like, okay, if I spend that much money, sometimes it's two guitars, or a more, more higher-end guitar that I maybe want not want to get rid of to get that guitar. So, anyways, the point of the story is, I started looking at used ones. The lowest used one I could find anyone <laughs> willing to take was $1,450, and we know a year ago, pre-COVID, if a guitar, especially a GNL, hard to sell guitar like a GNL, if it was at, if they were asking sixteen fifty, you would expect used to be maybe twelve hundred, probably a thousand, to be honest with you, right? Um, not always half, but maybe sixty percent, something like that. Anyways, this is why the story is funny. So two people on a platform that I won't name. <laughs> I sent them offers, and I said, even though they didn't have me make offer, I said, hey, I really want this guitar. Would you be willing to negotiate? No response from one, and the other one said no. So the why the story's funny is, Music Store Live, which is also, I think it's Big Dog or Big Daddy Music. It's two, I, it's one something dog. But Music Store Live, <laughs> I, they're the ones that had it for $16.50. I went into their website. I hit the chat window. And I said, would you ship me this guitar for $1,485 shipped? That's tax out the door, everything to me. Now, keep in mind, if I would have bought the guitar used for $1,450, it would have been $1,450 plus, let's say, $100 tax. $1,550. Guess what Music Store Live said? In on, on under 10 seconds, I got a message. Absolutely. We'll send you the invoice. And I paid it probably within a minute. Within five minutes, well, okay, I'm exaggerating now. That was all accurate. Maybe about 20 minutes, I had a tracking number. <laughs> I just bought a brand new guitar for less than used, and no one used would take it. Uh, thank you, uh, YHZ2002, it's Pitbull Audio. See, I knew it was some kind of dog. Uh, Pitbull Audio owns Music Store Life, they were who bought them. So it's, it's on both sides. I could have gone either way, I just... You know, I like Music Store Live because the way they show the pictures, even though it's the same same business, same entity. Um, <laughs> uh, Gerald says, why do you say GNL guitars are hard to sell? Because they're hard to sell. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm sorry, Gerald. I'm, I'm only laughing because, look, they are hard to sell. Um, I have owned many GNLs in the past. Many players have many stories like this. I love GNL. I love the GNL guys. Look, let me tell you, I would give my dollar to GNL. 
every time over Fender, every time I possibly can, okay? Why? Because I, I know the Fender guys, and I know the GNO guys, and the GNO guys, GNO guys are pretty down-to-earth, small company, small mentality, great quality guitars. They just don't invest in marketing. That's my personal opinion. They don't invest in marketing. A lot of people have a lot of theories why GNO doesn't sell that well. Um, it's because usually it's because they have an uh, ugly headstock. I'm getting tongue twied. Let me hold on a second. A lot of people contribute GNL's uh, lower sales uh, or lower resale value to their their undesirable headstock. Uh, that could be true. That happens. That's a plague a lot of guitar companies have to deal with. Some reason we just don't like a headstock and it doesn't sell as well. However, however, um, it it's been common for years. You can buy a GNL for less than a Fender. You know what I mean? That's kind of like the thing. Um, and if you have a GNL and you sell it, it's a little tricky to sell, right? It is. It just is. However, COVID has definitely firmed up the prices, as we see. My point to that story, and just that's not the only story I have this week, by the way. That story is obviously the retailers are still negotiating. They're still they're still making deals. Um, yet the resale. So I, I just I've never experienced this, so you guys know. There, and that's something new. 20 years in this business, <laughs> buying, selling, fixing guitars. I've never seen where I literally take out my ducats, my money, and wave it in front of sellers. And they they like, no, not interested, man. I got 50 buyers on this. By the way, neither, none of those guitars that were used sold yet. Uh, <laughs> right? And, and I could go to a retailer and say, hey, make me a deal. And they're like, absolutely. Money's money. So it's crazy. I had the same experience again with, uh, I bought another, I bought a used guitar this week. So behind me, if you can't tell, I'm pointing at it right now. If you're on the podcast, I'm pointing at a guitar. I'm pointing at a Music Man Axis in purple next to my PV Wolfgang in purple. So I now have the matching set. I decided I want Axis. You will find out why soon <laughs> because there will be a video about Axis, just the guitar in general and everything and kind of a fun thing. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to put a link to something uh, if you're watching the, the uh, reprocast right now. I'll put the link to this Axis. So anyways, what's funny about that was, same thing. Went out there looking at used accesses. Man, everybody's asking prime price. Prime, prime. Like, and I know it's because we, it's COVID. It's low guitar supply. Eddie passed away last year, which drove up the prices of guitars like his. Here's what's interesting about this. Same story. This guitar was used on a website. <laughs> Uh, but from a retailer, the retailer was Sam Ash. I reached out to Sam Ash, asked for a deal, got a smoking deal. In fact, it got such a good deal on this guitar that uh, it it led to, hey, there's a little extra over. Why don't I put it towards something else? And that's what led down to the road to the uh, GNL. So those are the two guitars purchased. If you guys know, I sold my Nags last week, uh, and uh, I sold um, two other guitars. What did I sell? Nags. I sold my Wolfgang because I knew I was getting the Music Man. That's I had to make room. Right. And I decided I wanted the access um, for the reasons you'll find out soon. And then I sold uh, I, I sold one other guitar. But anyways, um, the point is, that's that's what I did. I, I just you know rotated some stuff out. Interestingly enough, though, all week spending the whole week on reverb <laughs> and maybe eBay and other places. It was interesting time after time to watch everyone putting astronomical high prices on these guitars and. What I saw was a lot of it not selling, a lot of it sitting. I think this is, I don't know, okay? I, 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 again, because I'm talking to 990 of you and I, I and however many watch the rebroadcast and the podcast. So I don't want to say like, again, I don't want to pretend ever that I have some kind of crystal ball. Please understand, I'm asking questions just like you. I think we might have hit the top, the tippy top of this, uh, of this high price wave. I think we're, at, we're done. <laughs> um, I know the logic being that the the the, the point is demand will our uh, demand and supply will still apply. In other words, the low supply of used guitars will still keep the demand up. But I think we're at the height of the prices. This has just gotten crazy. Some of the, like I said, and my my reasoning for that, my reasoning for why I think we're at the tippy top was although I didn't find it very easy to find people willing to make me a deal on their used guitars. <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, on both the guitars I sold this week, uh, the EVH and the um, and the uh, the Nags, 
I was sent an offer and I think I accepted. I know for a fact on the next. I'm pretty sure on the EVH as well too. Very reasonable offers, by the way. They offered me like 10% less than I was asking. And, and I'm like, it's not exactly what I wanted to sell it for. But again, you know, we're, we're close and I have a buyer in hand. Why not move on, right? I was happy. But my point is, this is just crazy to watch this. I'm not paying, so you guys know, I'm not paying more for a guitar used than I can buy a new one. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I don't need anything that bad. Uh, so, no. Uh, <laughs> so there you, there you go. There you go. That was the thing. I would, What I'm really interested in is what you all think of this. How do you feel about the used prices? I feel like, of course, we have inflation. Of course, we have low supply because of nags. And, of course, a new interest because people are trapped at home. All those things factored in, absolutely. But man, oh man, it's just getting it's getting silly out there, and I just can't imagine this is going to hold. So, and the reason I say that is because as addicted to this as I am, and as much as I love this, you saw I won't do it. I won't pull that trigger. I will not buy guitars for these prices. So, I will. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Go do something else. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now I'm just looking. Anyone got any uh, input on that? Thoughts? Uh, and then we'll go do more questions, of course. But um, um, let's see. Um, <laughs> the only question. What's the blue guitar behind me? Uh, that is a Framus television. I have a video on that uh, if you want to watch the video on that. Um, uh, OH says doesn't seem to be as bad here in the UK. Yeah, it's it's been crazy. <laughs> like I said, it's been literally silly uh, how high the used prices are, and um, I mean it's, it's just nuts. And the selection is low, and of course that's the su supply demand factor. And I, again, I understand that. I agree with it. There's not a supply, and I understand getting top dollar for the gear you have. That I understand too. Again, I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining where I stand on this. Everybody's allowed to ask whatever they want. I will find a way, as I just explained I did, <laughs> right? I will either find the guitar I really want at the price I'm willing to pay, or I will do something else with my money. So, all right. Um, Paul says it's a good time to sell un unwanted gear. I, I believe so. Look, I thought that last year. That's why I sold 19 guitars last year. Um, I think in a couple weeks, you'll see, I told you guys a couple podcasts ago, I had to do an interview. In a couple weeks, I think you'll see the interview. That was something we discussed in that interview uh, was that that last year, the height of, and the COVID, the height, I don't know if it's the height of COVID, but last year when COVID happened, um, over the year, I bought four guitars, but I sold 19. I cleared out way more. And uh, the, I think the question, I don't know if this will be in the interview, but the question asked was, why did I do that? And I said, well, because I had done this before uh, when the recession happened in 2007, I saw the opportunity to buy. I bought as, as many guitars as I could during the recession as a store owner because I, I knew this was the time to buy the inventory. It's like the stock market. It's like you buy this inventory and then you can flip it later. This is the time to unload inventory, uh, you know what I mean, because it's at high price. But there's high price and then there's just it's getting silly. It's just silly at this point. Because again, I, I don't I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all you're like, I don't care. I don't care if it's 10 times more than a new guitar. <laughs> um, Don says, two-year waiting period for a Frankenstein EVH. Well, the EVH, the Eddie Van Halen thing, is a separate, I think, a separate thing. Okay? I don't think, because we know what it is. It's a perfect storm of, of horrible things to happen, events. It's, okay, you have, you have the COVID thing, and then... And that causes people to buy more guitars. And then that puts a drain on the available amount of guitars, which drives up the prices. And then Eddie passes, which then affects us emotionally, which makes us want to buy a guitar. You know what I mean? Eddie Van Halen guitar. Um, I I felt, uh, you know, I was lucky. I, I, I lucked out in the idea that uh, I told you guys, uh, emotionally, I bought that EVH white one, the one I just sold. I, I bought it emotionally because I was upset about Eddie passing. And I felt like this need to... I don't know, fill the, the sadness. <laughs> so it was the guitar. Sorry. It's my awkward laugh of, I don't, can't explain my logic. Just did it. And, um, but I think if I was really thinking about it, I would have bought an axis. I've been wanting an axis probably longer than, 
than anything, only because, not only because of Eddie Van Halen, but I'm, as you guys, some of you might know, old, old viewers from the beginning of the channel, I'm a huge Bowling for Soup fan, and uh, they, they, you know, the singer plays an axis. Um, Uh, okay, so I'm going to read some comments. So Glenn says, uh, what idiot would pay more for used uh, than you can buy a new one for less? Well, I mean, that's not, I understand. He's going to go, he's going for the jugular on the comment. I understand that. I try to ta taper it a little smoother, a little nicer, a little politer. Um, well, Glenn, I think sometimes it's that rationale. You need this. Look, you need this. I, I hope you guys are as, as lucky as I am in this collecting habit. I have a friend, I have a couple, I'm not bragging, I have two, maybe three, that I can text that picture. Should I buy this? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. Or, didn't you have one of those three years ago and got rid of it? You need that. It, it's a bounce back. That's why I hope this show, this is what this show gives a lot of us. Look, I... I I, uh, I, 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 you know, a lot of people know the story. I used to work in the corporate world and then I decided to stop and I went into this guitar world. And when I was in the corporate world, I was very lonely when it came to my hobby of guitars. I feel I, I, no one I knew. I mean, you know, there was 400 and something people in my building and not one of them played guitar. So there was nobody I knew. I would go, you know, to, to a party and we could talk politics, sports, which I absolutely love. Uh, and nobody would talk guitar. So just, you just had, you know, you, you know, you had to find somebody. So, so now I have friends that play guitar and it's nice to bounce crazy ideas off them. Like, Hey, thinking about getting this or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, so to answer your question, Glenn, it's, uh, yeah, they're an idiot. It's an idiotic thing to do, but a lot of times it's because you're not paying attention, not thinking to look, think about this. A lot of players, a lot of people, and I'm one of them who wouldn't. We could look at all the price. If you go and look at the prices of 10 guitars you used and they're all obnoxiously priced, it doesn't occur to you to go fishing down individual guitar websites or look for, you know what I mean? Like I said, a lot of us are like what I said earlier about me just contacting Music Store Live and asking for a deal and they gave it to me. Uh, a lot of you nodded probably when watching me say that, like, yeah, of course, that's what you do. And a bunch of you went, what? What do you mean you just make up a price and a music store just gave it to you online? Because as we know, like even Sweetwater, I tell you guys all the time, contact your Sweetwater rep, ask them for the price, ask them for the deal, right? Just ask for the deal. Always talk to somebody. I I personally don't like getting on the phone. So uh, like I said, with the uh, music store live, I did the, the chat, which is what I do with my rep. Oh, I didn't turn my phone off. <laughs> what I do with my rep, um, uh, what I do with my rep when uh, when I'm with Sweetwater, I don't I don't actually call him. I just email him. So so yeah, there's all kinds. So Jeff says I have more than a few. He says you got. He means me. You got more than a few friends that like to talk about guitar. Now 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 of course we could all talk guitar, <laughs> right? This is a weekly. Let's talk about guitars. I'm seeing interacting with your comments and stuff, but yeah, I'm just saying I can relate to some of you if if you were in the situation or in this currently in the situation I was in, which is I understand sometimes you know you work at a job and you know you don't look. It's not even a guitar player. That's one thing. <laughs> Meeting a guitar player and having a conversation about you know your favorite music or your favorite style of guitar playing or, or you know what what chords or scales you like or what style you like to play in that's a conversation but then finding that extra nerd guitar player geek whatever you want to call it that's like hey you know what i like to do with my free time stare at hours of ads about guitars <laughs> i like to look at uh, used guitars for about two hours a night <laughs> set up to, uh, and some of you i know you do it that's why you're here <laughs> Hopefully, I'm stopping you from doing that. So, um, so anyway, so uh, that being said, I thought that was a uh, an interesting week. <laughs> um, okay, hold on. Okay, so all right. On that note, we got to get to another subject. All right. So the next subject is what uh, we have some super chats, but like I said, I have some pin questions. I promise to get to the super chats. 
Uh, I just want to get to some of the pinned questions that were from before the show started. And uh, the second, the first uh, question question of the day was from David Munez. Munez, and he said, hey, Phil, never miss a video. I hear the 5e3 Mojo Tone kit, which is the kit I built in that Mojo Tone class. And uh, I did the shellac video for uh, Stu Mac because Stu Mac has the same kit as Mojo Tone. I think I've told you this. It comes from Mojo Tone. That's where Stumac buys it from, but they spec it differently. In other words, they ask for a couple higher in compa uh, components. I don't want to say capacitors, components. Um, and uh, so just just let you know, just information. Uh, it says, uh, it says. Uh, anyways, his question is that they, the, he's heard that the, the amps burn out tubes quick and they need repairs. Have you had any issues with yours? Thoughts? I have not had issues with mine. However, I'd like to point out that mine, I went to the class and they tested ours. And some of us, like I said, we didn't finish in time. And so they took our amps and then they tested them and checked them and sent them back to us, which is a service they do for anybody, not just dumb YouTube dudes. <laughs> they did that for everybody who was in the class. In fact, I think uh, Unfreaking Believable's here. I think his got tested like mine. And uh, so, yeah, I haven't had any issues. However, funny you said it. I have already blown one preamp tube in that amp. Uh, and that's just the luck of tubes, man, because I think they use JJ's, which I, I usually like, and I tell you guys that's what I recommend. Uh, but I did have to replace a tube. It fried out. I don't remember how I knew. I don't remember if the amp turned off or was making a sound, but I just remember I had to replace that tube, uh, preamp tube because I went, remember I went downstairs in my shop, and I don't keep a lot of tubes. I have like a, a smattering of just random tubes in my shop because I'm not an amp guy. And I, I remember going, oh, sweet, I have it. <laughs> and I went upstairs and plugged it in and was working. It's been working since, so no issues. But here's the deal. Is it possible? Sure. I don't think it's a faulty uh, a fault in the components be because I, I really feel like the Mojo Tone guys really go to great lengths to use good components for those amps. I really believe it. And of course, I all I have to believe is what they told us in the class and showed us. But, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, not an idiot. <laughs> so, I mean, what they were explaining made a lot of sense. I mean, it was like, okay, yeah. I um, mean, the, the, the fact what they use, how they test it. So it was pretty good. So um, I'm sure it's possible. The problem with something like that is you don't know how much is a user error and how much is the design or and or the components problems. But what I can tell you with the Mojo Tone guys is uh, you can literally call them and get help. So, I mean, there's there's it sounds like such a it sounds like such a passe thing to say, like, oh, you can call anybody and get help. But that's not true. You know what I mean? Um, you can call people and get customer service. <laughs> But uh, Mojo Tone can actually help you. They'll actually have people that will get on the phone and help you and finish stuff out and send pictures back and forth and do stuff. Um, so um, so there you go. So there, that's my answer to that, if that helps. Um, okay. The Lone Wolf. A Lone Wolf. That's what I said. The, the Lone Wolf. A, a Lone Wolf. I'm a, a Lone Wolf. I'm a Lone Wolf. I hope you guys get that joke. That's a uh, Bruce Campbell joke. <laughs> I'm an alone wolf. You mean a lone wolf? That's what I said. I'm an alone wolf. Anyways, a lone wolf says, Hey, Phil, I know I have 21 guitars, 16 electric, and 5 acoustics while living in a full time in a 38 foot diesel pusher motorhome. The problem is, yeah, we. We're going to guess. <laughs> I'm going to guess. I'm not going to read the rest of the question. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm going to guess that the problem is, is that your guitars are literally spanned, uh, 21 guitars. Uh, if you space them out two feet on one wall, run the distance to that. <laughs> okay. So anyways, all right. It says, okay, the problem is, he's going to tell us. The problem is I couldn't part with a single one of my guitars. I understand that. <laughs> this is the good news, a lone wolf. The good news is you live in a 38-foot diesel pusher. And so your your problem could be much worse. I, I, I've said this before. I have no problem admitting my faults. <laughs> I have many of them. I just don't want to mention them all in one show every time. Uh, my room is very small. This room I'm in is very small. It's very tiny. This is the guitars, by the way. There's two on the other wall that you can't see right now, but that's it. Um, and then in my other room, I have a few guitars in that room, <laughs> okay? 
Uh, if I had a bigger house, I'd have more guitars. It'd be stupid. <laughs> In fact, a lot of times when everybody's like, oh, you sold a guitar. I only sell guitars because of room. Uh, okay, money is a factor always, but room is more of a factor in my life than money by far. It's because guitars just, and they do this, even in cases and gig bags, they suck up room. And I don't like guitars that I can't play. So a lot of people will case their guitars. It's like a thing. They like to, uh, they like to case a bunch of guitars up, play a bunch of guitars when they get bored, swap the thing. I, I find if I put a guitar in a case and put it in a closet, I'll go a year or two. And I won't even think about that guitar. I will. I literally, no exaggeration, literally play the guitar that is closest to whatever amp I'm going to play. So if I put a guitar right on a hanger next to me, that's what I'll play for weeks. If I didn't do YouTube, I literally wouldn't even touch the other guitars because I just get in the habit to grab the one that's next to me. So, yeah, I understand. <laughs> so the good news is I think you have enough guitars, man. I'm just saying. 21 for that for that spacing is uh, that's tight. You can see how I did it. That's about as packed in as you can get them. I, I, I did a lot of work over the years. If you notice in this room, I was determined to fit all my guitars in this little tiny room and I did it. There they are. That is, that is 90% of my collection. Um, because I don't, there's one, I'm looking behind me. There's one. Oh, there's actually not that many today. Two. I won't tell you guys because, uh, I think there's two, I see two or three. So there's two or three guitars They're They're in the cycle of loan for the channel and the rest are like mine. So, that's what it is. Sometimes when people ask, how many guitars do I have? Well, I have so many guitars, but then there's guitars coming in and out for the channel for, for review purposes or whatever. So, uh, okay. Gear Junkie 35 says, I ordered my Know Your Gear. Oh, Know Your Tone shirt. So we got the, the TK mashup still available down below in the link. I talked to Tone King. I don't remember if he told me I'm allowed to tell everybody what he decided. What did he decide? I I think you have till the end of March to buy the, those shirts. I think that's what we decided. And then we'll pin them again like we did. But last time we told everybody, this is why I'm telling you this. Last time we told everybody we were going to do it like in a year, and it was two and a half, three years ago. <laughs> so anyways, uh, he just got one yesterday. He says close to the rollover. So what he's talking about is it, when we hit 300,000 subscribers, uh, the logo changes on the shirt. So yes, uh, I don't know where we're at. Where are we at? Let's look in real time because I'm sure you guys are so interested in how many subscribers we have. 299,948. So we're 52 subscribers away from 300,000, but that's not true. Like I told you, I'll lose five in the next 10 minutes and I'll get 10 and then I'll lose three. Just that's how it goes all day. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is, oh, it's a double question. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a double question. So here's the question. The question is, did I get a Kramer uh, Sabo guitar? I, I did not. Uh, it's a very long story. <laughs> it is a very long story. Um, it's actually not that long. Here's how it goes. I ordered one uh, before they ever came out. Um, I received it uh, just recently, and I was very excited, and it has an issue, and it has to go back. I had talked uh, to... Um, I talked about uh, doing a promotion with one and maybe doing a giveaway with one. And that's the promotion. And uh, long story short, that's kind of all fell through. So there you go. So at this point, uh, I might get the one I had exchanged. I, I don't know. So that's where I'm at with that. And if I do, then great. If not, uh, you know, technically that money just went towards the, the access. <laughs> okay. Um, next. Next question. Let's uh, let's go. Let me just because thirty minutes in. Let me uh, let me do one more, and then we'll hit some super chats. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just skimming through, looking for. And again, I really appreciate everybody that comes early and leaves questions and stuff. Okay. So the question the question I'm looking for. There was an interesting question. It really tied into something I wanted to talk about. So I'm hoping to, I thought that's why I grabbed it. Oh, okay. There was two. Okay. So here it is. This is from Joyce. Uh, Joyce is, this is the two part question or two sections. Joyce was saying, Hey, Phil, have you ever, have you ever had your dog 
Has your dog, my dog, accidentally trashed any of my gear, knocked it over, a cherished guitar, or just a lighthearted question? Uh, it's just a lighthearted question for Friday. Okay, so she's saying, don't be too serious. I got you. So, uh, yes and no. My dog has never damaged, my dogs uh, have never damaged any of my guitars um, because they all hang on a wall. However, when I got my, my newest dog that I have, that my wife got, when he was a puppy, uh, he ate all my microphone, the foam things that are on there. Oh, I'm tapping the mic. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, so uh, he ate, ate every single one of them. <laughs> uh, all my mics, of course, are usually mic and cabinets are low. And I guess like we would walk by the mic stand, he thought it was like, oh, a snack. And he just like grabbed it and ate it. Uh, did that. He ate, uh, he ate one of my microphones, chewed it up, <laughs> one of my lapel mics. Uh, anything that was small like that. So, I mean, some gear like that was uh, trash. The only damage I've ever had to an instrument was done by my son. And uh, and that, if you haven't experienced, I'll uh, tell you guys why. Why all my guitars are on the wall, have been forever, and only on string swing. Because, one, that's the only thing I trust first. So, string swing is the only thing I use, period. And that's the only thing I trust. That's just how it goes. Uh, um, so... That being said, uh, why are my guitars hanging on my wall is when when my son was young, very young. I don't know how old. Could have been, I don't know, when they barely can talk. <laughs> I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting in the kitchen and I heard this sound. It was shtoot, 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 shtoot. And and it was like, huh, that's an odd sound. What is that? What is that sound? And then around the corner is my son dragging my very beautiful Warwick bass over the tiles. Shtoot, shtoot, shtoot. And right as I looked in horror of dismay of what, a, what is, what, what? <laughs> my son goes, I, I brought this for you. <laughs> and, I, and that's what's great about kids when they're young, that God makes them cute so we don't kill them. Um, cause at that point I was like, well, isn't that the cutest thing? And then I picked up the base and I didn't look at it for about an hour. <laughs> and then I looked at it and yeah, it was chewed. <laughs> um, so here's why they're on the wall. My son just, it was in a guitar stand. He couldn't lift it. That thing was probably 10 pounds. It was, um, it just, he just knocked it over on the floor and dragged it into the kitchen. So... There's your hit. There's your tip, guys. Anybody, any, or women, anybody expecting a kid, get the crap on the wall as fast as you can. <laughs> and if you have a dog, just put your stuff on the wall is what I'm saying. Or keep it in a case. A lot of OMGs. Yeah, it was cute and horrible. It's a lot funnier now. <laughs> it's actually hilarious now. Back then, not so much. <laughs> So, so there you go. There's that. The other, uh, the other, <laughs> the other part of uh, Joyce's comment was, uh, uh, they were thanking me for the Ibanez uh, video, and I don't know why I can't see it now. Um, but that's what it was, and uh, it was mentioning the squishy uh, donation. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm remembering it was Joyce. I could be wrong because I know it pinned it. Um, and I thought it was a good way to segue in this. If you saw that, I did the review of the RG565, uh, and in that, I uh, we donated. I say we. It's a better way to put it. We on the channel here, we donated $40 to the Squishy program. But uh, project, but I want to share with you, I have today, I'm wearing my Squishy shirt. I bought a Squishy shirt. They sent me some promotional stuff, too, after I bought the shirt. And uh, that's kind of another reason why I wanted to send them $40. Um, the, uh, the, uh, that, you know, I said, Hey, I want me to buy a shirt. And then they, they said, we'll send you a shirt. I said, no, I want to buy it. This is how this goes back and forth on emails. And then I bought the shirt anyways. And then they included a bunch of other swag with it. <laughs> and then I'm like, I won't stand for that. So I donated $40 as I, first opportunity. I was, I was looking for an opportunity. So, you know, in that video, I was looking for any reason to send some money to that project because uh, look, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, uh, stop the momentum of talking about guitars, but I just want to tell you guys uh, about the Squishy Project. It's a link down below. I, I suggest you guys, if you if you find that stuff interesting, uh, if you feel like you're lucky or fortunate enough in this world right now and you want to help somebody out, I, I, I just suggest it. I, I'm, I'm connected to it. Here's why. I can identify with the family. My son was hurt very badly. He was airlifted to a hospital and we were told, this is years and years ago, 
we were told he wasn't going to make it. To the, get to the point of that, they were so serious, we had to airlift him to the children's hospital. So a hospital airlifted my son to another hospital because they said there's nothing they could do for him. Children's hospital saved my son's life. That's why we donate to them every year. I just tell you that anytime, so I'm just telling you where I'm at as a person. Anytime I see anybody's child suffering, I'm going to do what I can. And if that means we break the momentum of a guitar channel for a few minutes to talk about it, there it is. We'll get back to the guitar channel. But like I said, cool shirt, cool cause. Check it out if you are so inclined. Otherwise, uh, you know, thank you for supporting this channel because at least that support goes that way too. All right. Um, what are we going to talk about next? Well, we're going to hit some super chats because I've been letting them, letting them idle for a little while. Um, the first one is from Adrian. Adrian said, uh, Adrian says, Hey Phil, just discovered, uh, my channel a month ago, learned more in ab about guitar from you in a month than years on my own. You ever play a Fender subsonic baritone Strat? I just got one and I would love to have you check it out. I have never played one. I don't think I've played Fender's bass sixes, Squire bass sixes, uh, baritone telly. I don't think I've ever played a baritone Stratocaster. So no, I haven't. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm curious. You got me curious. That's an interesting instrument. Um, I will look at them online. <laughs> They'll probably be overpriced right now, but we'll still look at them online because they don't currently make one. So I imagine you had to buy yours used. I was still looking up. Um, I'm going to say Asa, Asa, Asa Valdovinos uh, says, Hey, Phil, I own an Epiphone T-Bird. T-Bird. It's a great guitar, but heavy. They can be. Some of them lighter than others. Depends on the wood, the density of the wood, how much moisture is in the wood. But yeah, generally not the lightest of guitars. Uh, do you have any short scale bass suggestions for two to four hundred dollars range? Um, uh, and, oh, and you put the phonetics. Uh, uh, like Asa, Asa. Is that what I said? I think I said Asa, right? All right. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, of course, uh, for short scale, of course, if you like Epiphones, don't forget Epiphone has some really cool shorter scale basses as well. Those are really good. I like those. I like the, uh, the Ibanez short scale basses. I like Squire short scale basses. I know this is being generic in the brands. Um, another cool place for short scale basses is SX and you can find that from Rondo Music. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, I haven't been there in a few months, so I don't know how relevant that is. You could go there and they won't carry them or are they out of stock, but um, from memory, two to four hundred dollars would get you. I used to have a short scale, thirty inch scale uh, P bass from SX. Loved it, and uh, I had it for years and years. And then I got an opportunity to buy my Stuham Urge bass that's behind me. That blue bass behind me is a thirty inch scale Stuham bass that's very special to me. Uh, so I was uh, that was an opportunity to get that. Kind of like what we were talking about earlier. You know, sometimes you know something's got to come in, something's got to go. I can't have you know four of the same thing. Uh, Greg says, congratulations on your upcoming 300,000 subscribers. Thank you. I appreciate that. We are going to do something for 300,000 subscribers. Uh, it's been discussed and I'll, I'll unveil that as we go. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little something, maybe a little something exciting because it's a, it's a milestone. It feels like a milestone to, to, you know, to a YouTube channel, the hundred thousand thing is a big deal because you get the plaque. It's like a big deal to get this plaque after that. You know what I mean? It's not the same feeling, but it's just nice. It's nice to know, know the channel keeps gets some kind of momentum going. It's really cool. Um, Declan's question says, Hey, Phil, do you think Music Nomad will send you their new nut files to try out? Question mark. Good quality, low cost files would be a real winner in this market. So, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, Okay, so let me tell you what I can tell you. Uh, as you guys know, I always try to be up front with you guys, but sometimes I have NDA stuff a little bit in the background. There's no real NDA on this. Uh, that's non-disclosure agreement. I have met with Music Nomad. Uh, we did a Zoom call. I think it was about two weeks ago. I can't remember. Uh, and um, I, I talked to them before. They reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to do a video with their nut files and their new KISS uh, setup system. And I have been very interested in this uh, concept. I, as you guys know, my whole channel, at least I feel like, my channel is predicated on the idea of how do you, the newcomer to guitar repair, do some guitar repair? And 
so obviously anybody who's saying, hey, look, we're going to create a system. I got to tell you, some of the stuff they did, and I, I went through an actual PowerPoint. They actually showed me a whole PowerPoint presentation. It was a, like a real, I feel like a real business person. Like we sat, went through all this information, uh, instructional information, all this stuff, because and they were very serious, so you guys know. I feel, I feel very privileged. They, uh, they had told me uh, that I'm the only YouTube channel that they reached out to, and f they wanted me to do this demonstration of their product. And I let them know, as you guys have seen in the new videos where I'm diagnosing the guitars and try that I would love to apply their stuff to that concept as well to see if, because that would be maybe uniformly uh, better for you guys if you see me go, okay, here I got a guitar. Here's what I find wrong with it. Here's how I'm fixing it. Here's how I diagnosed it. Here's how I fix it. And then it would be really cool if I was using a lot of times a kit, although not an expense, inexpensive guys, but let's be fair in my world of repair, their kit, their setup kit is $20 less than I charge to set up your guitar. So their kit feels expensive, but if you were to buy it and be successful, you just put $20 in your pocket. That If you only get one setup, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, so, uh, <laughs> Ken says, kiss, darn it. I just learned train. They're all, all, they all apply. Look, I took this very seriously. Everything that they're showing you in their kit, I think, uh, as you guys know, I've been very clear about this over the years. I've shown you guys, uh, I try to be as balanced as I can for stuff. I go, here's some Stumac stuff. And here's how I use Stumac. And you guys go, that's expensive. And I go, great. Here, I'll go to a damn dollar store. And I bought some stuff at a dollar store and did a setup. And then they go, that's junk. And I go, okay, I went to Amazon. So I've done as many videos as I can crossing as many platforms of different tools. And I continue to do so because just like guitars, I don't think there's a $3,000 guitar or a $30, well, no such thing as a $30 guitar, but $300 guitar, $3,000 guitars all have a place in the world. Uh, and tools work the same way. So yes, to answer your question, uh, yeah, not only will I do a video, but I plan to integrate it into some of the more of these to continue on down the road that I've been going with these new reviews, uh, which is... Uh, I like the saying, I, I, I didn't coin it, obviously, but I've been using a lot, to play it where it lands. Every guitar now, I just open up the box, you see the unbox, you see what I have to deal with, um, you know what I mean? And, and then I go from there. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah, so the answer to your question, Declan, yeah, you'll be seeing that on the channel. Um, uh, exactly what you said, they're coming out soon, and I thought in my conversation with them, they will be shipping them to me as soon as they're available to you guys too, so I'll be doing that. And yeah, yeah, and then uh, and uh, and in fact, here's just something really cool. I, I you know, since I'm going to share something really cool, um, uh, since you guys should deserve it because you guys are the people hanging out with me on my podcast, you deserve this information. Uh, two things that I thought were super crazy cool. First of all, they showed me where uh, showed me a cool trick with their files. And once I saw the trick, which is the files pop out of those yellow plastic forms and and that they've already learned from some of the luthiers where there's some issues with the plastic forms, but there's a way to pop them out. And you can still use them that way and pop them in. So I'll be demonstrating that in the video. That's really cool because they didn't have that out yet because that's something they learned uh, since the product uh, launch. But, but the other thing that really cool is... Um, if you want to look it up, I'll put a link in the description. It's not an affiliate link. Well, it might be if I have Sweetwater link, I'll use that. But if I don't, you know, I'll just use whatever link. But get it where you like. Sweet uh, Music Nomad now has an Allen wrench kit. And it has every Allen wrench you'll ever need to adjust any neck ever. But more importantly, on their website, absolutely free, is a free uh, Allen wrench truss rod lookup feature. And I already tested it. In fact, I got the Tone King to test it with me. I had him do it as a favor. And I said, you know, and so you can go on Music Nomad's website. Um, and if I seem excited, it's because I am excited. This stuff like this, well, first of all, you don't even have to buy their kit. They're just giving you free information. So that's just cool. So you go to uh, Music Nomad's website, look up Trust Rod Allen Wrench, you know, locator. You'll see what I'm talking about when you go on their website. And you click it, you can click, click down. It's a drop down menu. Any guitar, Charvel, it'll say Charvel US. Japan, Mexico, you know what I mean? All the variations, the years. You click the, the one you have, it tells you exactly what Allen wrench in this kit or socket wrench or whatever you need. It's in this kit. And the kit's like 70 bucks. It's not cheap, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> and if you don't want to buy their kit, they're giving you the information where what wrench you can use if you already have it. So, uh, so there you go. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, so I, it says American Music Supply. I'm assuming it might be Greg. So if it's not Greg, hi, not Greg. But if it's Greg, hey, Greg. It says we met face-to-face -face, uh, for the first time last year at uh, at NAMM. Yes, who in introduced me to Morgan and everybody at Music Nomad. So that's how they kind of knew how to have a relationship with me, which is, which is really cool. So shout out to American Music Supply. Because as you know, they also put together, well, especially Greg, he put together the Sabo uh, interview, as always, which is really cool. Okay. Now we're going to hit the next subject. Um, okay, I'm looking at what you guys are saying, and I got, I got to get, I'm sorry, I got to stay focused on questions. We'll never get through them otherwise. Uh, next one is from, it's from somebody, if I refresh the screen. Okay. It's always scary. When I have to refresh the screens, it means more stuff stacked up than I thought. This is from Steve. Steve says, hey, Phil, I'd really love to get into your guitar into guitar maintenance. Uh, what's the best way to go about this? Should I get a kit or work on uh, it after assembly? So in other words, this is the age old question of, hey, is it better to learn on a guitar kit or on repairing uh, guitars? I personally, it's my personal thing, of course, it's because that's the way I learned. I personally think the best thing you can do is take guitars that are already built, find the issues with them, and fix them. And the stepping process, which is why I'm trying to do my uh, review videos this way, to kind of cement this logic of everyone should learn to diagnose a problem because whether you want to do it or not is irrelevant, you know, right? That's up to each person to decide. And whether you can afford it, of course, is that's that's you know that's your decide as well. However, being informed is never a bad thing. So knowing what's wrong with the guitar when you go to talk to somebody, have it repaired, or is a good idea. So I say the best thing you can do is get your hands on some cheap guitars. Now, of course, you can buy some Glaries and stuff. You know, I, that's why I review those. Those are cheap, seventy-five dollar guitar. It's obviously going to have an issue. Almost every Glary has some kind of issue, which is can be corrected. Some are worse than others, <laughs> but you know you can correct that. However, I've suggested this many times in the past. Uh, you know, everyone knows somebody that has a junky guitar, and they'll probably let you kind of take your take a whack at it, <laughs> right? Uh, it, try to. That's the scenario you're looking for. You're like, hey. Uh, my neighbor's got a Behringer Strat that they never played and the frets are poking out. What a great opportunity for you to fix it for them. You get the, the skill set. They get a better guitar. And if it doesn't work out, well, then, you know, they've taken the risk because they're getting free labor. Again, it's a it's a, a great way to start. So, yeah, fixing up cheap guitars. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> just find yourself. Go to, your, go to a pawn shop or music store and just try to find that just that three string missing dented fret disaster and give it a shot it'll you'll you'll go far kit guitars i feel like you can learn a lot there's no downside to that in the concept of it but i uh, price wise i still think you can find cheaper you know used beat up guitars than you can buy a kit uh there's uh, some cheap kits out there but my experience is the cheaper the kits get the worse it's going to get anyways where a cheaper guitar you still have a shot of getting a semi decent guitar and just having to do some issues with it cuz again you're not you don't want to have to do crazy luthier work to a guitar to start out on. You just want to fix simple issues. First, fixing frets. The, the, the other thing, Steve, that's going to help you is this. The two things that everyone has problems with is soldering and fret work. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of players are very comfortable adjusting necks, adjusting bridges, setting intonation. That's stuff that most people, if they watch a video, they're like, okay, I feel like I can do that now to my guitar, and they feel very confident. Uh, if you want to be successful in doing guitar maintenance for not only yourself but for others, look at the two things that everybody doesn't want to work with, electronics and fret work. Um, and I only say it because literally uh, that's the foundation of all my repair work. Like that's where I make all my money. <laughs> Somebody's got something, uh, some haywire uh, electronic issue or their frets are jacked up. I will always make money with that. Um, it's very rare when it's like, hey, will you just adjust this neck for me? Because a lot of times if I do that, it's like, I just did one last week for a customer. He had a Martin and all it needed was a neck relief, a quarter turn. And he's like, how much? And I'm, I don't know, what do you charge for that? So I used to have a bench fee, <laughs> to, you know what I mean? But now I just like, uh, free. <laughs> so, uh, you know what I mean? So it's nicer if it has a little bit more problematic because it's more time. The more time I spend, the more money I can make. So, uh, you know, doing the repair. Guillermo says, hey, Phil, your opinion on the PRS, SE, Paul's guitar, a good one to learn mods? 
Hmm. Okay. Let me think about that for a second as I keep going. As always, a beer on me. Oh, yes. $15. Yes. Yes. Actually, you know what, Guillermo? You uh, actually did buy me a beer. I, My wife was nice enough. She got me a growler yesterday of my favorite beer from Four Peaks. Four Peaks is a brewery in Tempe. She drove to Tempe and uh, got me a growler, which is like a 32-ounce beer. It's like, But it comes straight from the keg, and it's beautiful. And uh, so I have that for this weekend, and literally, you just bought it. Thank you. <laughs> so you didn't buy me a beer. You bought me a growler, man. Thank you. I will I will drink it and think of of your question, but I will answer it first. Okay, so uh, yeah, the PRS SE Paul's guitar. Is this a guitar to do mods on? Sure, because things you would have to upgrade on that guitar, of course, I think upgrade those tuning keys because I didn't like the Cluson style keys. Uh, nothing wrong with them. I just like locking, so you can upgrade the tuning keys on the guitar. That's a good move. Uh, strap locks are not exciting, but still something you can upgrade. And the pickups. The pickups are great. I don't know if I would actually change them out. Well, actually, I would. <laughs> I would, because uh, I like certain kinds of pickups. Um, but if that's something you want to do, and it's what's great about that is the way they wired that guitar up, it's fantastic. So you can really not have to worry about some of the crazier stuff, the intricate stuff. But it's going to be a minor, mo minor, modder. It's going to be a modder, minor guitar. It's going to be a minor, modded modification guitar. But there it is. It's uh, so yeah, pretty good. Uh, the drunken scoundrel says, "Phil, I just bought a '89 Strat Plus. Oh, what color? You probably didn't say. My my dream Strat was '89 Strat Plus. Could be '90. I don't care what year. But Strat Plus with either the two tone silver or the blue, which now they reissued. Basically, it's the new blue one. Uh, the gray, the gray with the blue." Um, uh, but yeah, I love that. Anyways, uh, and the, and the lace sensors, but they don't do lace sensors anymore. Uh, but it says Wilkinson nut, uh, won't even fit a set of four, uh, nine to 42s. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's talk about his issue. Cause that's an issue that I've come across many times with that guitar and that issue. Uh, is there an L uh, alternative to the LSR or can I, uh, glue the LSR net in? Uh, I don't want to drill holes. Okay. So basically, um, He's talking about the issue is uh, the nut. So that that nut is metal and it has ball bearings in it. And if the strings aren't fitting through the nut, my guess is they're stuck. So what I would do, it's what I would do. If I if you gave me the guitar today for repair, I would yank that nut off. Well, I would take it off nicely. <laughs> I would take the nut off. I would spray the crap out of a w, w, WD-40. And I have this little bristle like wire brush. And I would just get in there and try to get all that, those little ball bearings and all that stuff moving and all that stuff uh, taken care of. Especially because 9 to 42s, you shouldn't have that. 10 to 46, you shouldn't have the problem either. But 9 to 42s, but that's what it is. Uh, and then and then install it back and then restring it up. And, you know, I mean, shake it, clean it with a paper towel. You know what I mean? But super easy. That should fix it. Um, just like I said, they just get corroded and stuck in there. It's a cool idea, but, you know, it gets corroded. The They're like chrome. Uh, not really chrome. What should I say? They're like shiny steel, and they get little pits in them, and they stick. So that's what I would do. I hope that makes sense. But if it doesn't make sense, just trust me. Take the thing off. Spray the crap out of W40. I, W40 is just easy. I'm assuming you have it. So, I mean, you can use other stuff too, but I use that. And then, like I said, you need something. If you don't have a little wire brush, uh, just get a you know you pick, get your wife's little toothbrush. <laughs> your, your name is the drunken scoundrel I assuming ethics are going to be implied uh, you know loosely here so so yeah just take your wife's uh, toothbrush and just clean it out <laughs> don't put it back though that's just wrong don't put it back on her sink toss it in the trash and then tell her you know you don't know what she's talking about when you see my toothbrush no no anyways that's horrible ethics but eh, maybe a good joke hopefully that made you laugh all right <laughs> so let me get back to uh let me get back on track. All right. Why Why am I... It took... I apologize, but it's moved. Okay, there you go. Michael. Hey, Michael, what's up? From uh, Big Harry Guitars. Says, hey, Phil. Uh, by the way, he just hit 25,000 subs. So if you haven't subbed to his channel, uh, Michael's the real deal. I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to say it like that, you know, embarrass him, but he is the real deal. So check out his channel, Big Harry Guitars on YouTube. Uh, 
And if you're looking for a suggestion, always check out the uh, Zach Wild non-bearded days. Just trust me. Just type in Zach Wild and Big Hair Guitars, and I promise you it's better than watching this live show. So anyways, <laughs> says, uh, hey, Phil, um, all my trim guitars have a firm trim action. I get easy... I get easier trim bending action. Oh, to get easier trim bend action, is it as simple as going from three to two springs? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Michael, and again, I, I think this will hopefully make sense. Think about it like we already know how this work kind of works, especially if your trim's floating, right? If it's not floating, it doesn't matter. You know, right? it's against the body or whatever. But whether it's floating or not, think about this. You need you need as much pressure attention from the springs as the strings to kind of hold the bridge floating right but um when you pull on the just like strings right when you pull on the bridge when you pull on the springs those strings the way they kind of expand is what we're feeling when when the bridge is in movement so not only does going three to two or you know uh, or going the other way uh, other direction three to four change the way it can feel even though it's equalized tension in other words because whether you have, because I've had this argument before, whether you have three or two, you still have to set the same amount of tension, right? Because the bridge has to still float. That's true. However, it's the way it feels once it's doing this. I've had this argument with bending, right? Some people will say, well, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean, when you set the string's tension on the bridge, uh, whether the bridge is anchored or whatever. And I'm like, it does when it bends. Everything's about when the string's in, in play is where you're going to feel things happening. So there's two ways to think about this. Yes, decreasing the amount of springs will change the feel. You will have to adjust the bridge to the same tension, but it will feel different when you bend it, uh, the tremolo, but also changing the type of springs. I highly recommend this, especially you, because you're obviously a really competent player and you've got a lot of gear. And so I don't think you're it's going to hurt your pocketbook. I would go to FU Tone and try the the spring set, the springs. They have the purple, yellow, red, black. You can try all the different tension springs. Buy a set of each. I was lucky. My buddy Eric bought a set of all those and gave them to me, and then I was I didn't have to do it. And then once I did it, I was like, okay, this is for me. Uh, you can figure out where you are in this. Uh, it's a minor investment that kind of makes a fun weekend of messing around with stuff. Try that out. Aaron Peacock. Hey, Aaron. How's it going? It says, hey, uh, oops, hold on a second. It says, hey, have you ever had your hands on a Fender Ultra Strat HSS? What did you think? How well does the split humbucker perform? By the way, love the channel. Love the backlog of the live shows. Thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate that. Um, I have not, I have played, wait, I'm trying to think. I, so then now there's a new Ultra, right? Like, uh, it's so confusing. <laughs> it's like ultra and ultra something i've played two ultra strats three play three ultra strats whatever was the ultras before this year when they made the stainless steel ultras whatever they call that ultra now um and uh played them i'm not a fan of those pickups there's nothing wrong with them if you have an ultra strat right now and you love those pickups i promise we'll be friends i <laughs> I'm not judging you. There's uh, there's countless things I'm sure you could like about those pickups. I don't. Uh, they don't appeal to me. Uh, there's something about them that just doesn't do it for me. They're not aggressive enough to be aggressive pickups for me, and they're not stratty, vintagey enough to be vintage. They're somewhere in the middle that I'm just not finding the sweet spot for me, my personal taste. Um, so that to answer your question is, uh, I have tried the HSS, didn't love it. Uh, the, the pickups, but I didn't like the uh, other iterations of those pickups either. There's no Fender noiseless pickups that I've played that I've liked. <laughs> so uh, maybe the vintage ones, the original ones, a little. But to be honest with you, and and to give you a reference, so you guys can bar, put a bar on this, I would rather have laces than those. And a lot of you guys would be the opposite of me. You would be like, the laces are horrible. So it's just, again, just different strokes, different folks, different flavors. So that's my flavor choice. So that's my answer to that. Um, so the answer to the question is, how do I how do I think the split humbucker performed? Uh, it's, again, none of it was to my uh, liking. The guitar itself, fantastic. I love the guitar. Um, the pickups. Also, the problem is those pickups are problematic. I've already fixed two of them. I've had to do two repairs on them. So just the, by design. It's the, the idea, this idea of putting a PC board at the bottom of the pickup seems to uh well bugs the hell out of me because one i think they're doing because it it's cheap and, and they're trying to be consistent and maybe that's good cheap and consistent cheap and consistent's good but right now it just means i gotta fix them and it's not fun to fix them um so i'm not a fan of that <laughs> so there you go so on the answer the, the hardest answer i can give you on the, on the guitar is i love the guitar 
and I don't let the pickups. Kindle from Bensonut. Hey, what's up? Hold on a second. I gotta drink water. All right. Happy Friday, Phil. Do you think an American Fender from the 90s will be a valuable collector's item 30 to 40 years from now? I think anything made in the USA will be valuable. The argument, of course, and again, this is we're now we're back in the opinion world, right? Nobody knows the future. And if you do, give me a call at. <laughs> no, seriously. No one knows the future. The arguments are simple. There's two arguments in play. Looking at the history of guitars, all guitars went up in value for the most part. We'll say 90%. That seems safe, especially the American stuff and the Japanese stuff, right? However, the, the counter argument is younger generations won't give a crap, right? Um, but I my theory is separate than those theories. Here's my theory. Guitar's value is about availability, right? doesn't matter where it's made. You can make a guitar in China. And if everybody, if, if 50 people want one and there's three on the planet Earth, somebody's going to have to pay for it, <laughs> right? So that's my point. Uh, here's an example. If you would ask me 10 years ago, would a PV Wolfgang made in the USA be worth three grand or two grand or whatever people are asking for it now, I would have laughed. I wouldn't have answered it with yes. <laughs> I would have laughed. Like right now, I'd be like, this is that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Who would why buy a PV used USA guitar for value? So the reality is it's not valuable because of any of the reason they don't make them anymore. And uh, there's not a whole lot out there comparatively speaking. So to answer your question, yes, uh, I don't know how much value it is. I don't, I can't tell you. I can't say something's going to be worth fifty thousand dollars or five thousand dollars. We don't know. But what I what I do know is is that anytime there doesn't seem to be a lot of guitars, um, as time goes by, they seem to go up. And I've seen that consistently. I would bet on that than bet, bet on the contrary. And even if kids uh, today, when they're 40 years old, because that's what you're talking about, right? 30 to 40 years from now, you're talking about 10-year-old kids and 20-year-old kids, you know, uh, when they hit their 30s and 40s or whatever, 40s and 50s, and they're in the m mood to collect because, uh, you know, hey, that's the, they got the ducats, you know, right? Um uh, they're going to want, obviously what they wanted when they were kids, that would be practical, right? But they're also going to want what was in the history of guitar, and they're also going to want what's cool and unique. I think that will all factor it in. So yeah, the question is how much? That's where it really gets tricky. Like when people predict a fallout in this stuff, like basically at some point vintage guitars won't have value. Th not no value, they just won't be obscene, right? I think, and I, and a, please, please, I don't know, okay? <laughs> I just, I read something once, and I thought I read, and it could change, but I thought it was a couple years ago. I thought I read where, like, that's happening in the car industry, where, like, Model T cars aren't as valuable as they used to be because the generations that would love those cars have kind of, like, passed away, and they're, or they're old, you know, in their retirement, and they don't want to buy stuff like that. I thought I read that, and so that essentially what happens is they're saying, like, older cars, like Model T era cars, that style of car is not as valuable. And that was kind of, I think, the logic of the whole, you know, um, like I love a Vince Sevenfold. So let's say I'm, uh, you know, I'm 20 years old right now and I love a Vince Sevenfold. Uh, in 20 years when I'm 40, will I want a Korean made uh, Sinister Gates guitar? Or will I pay, you know what I mean, for a 90s uh, Strat Plus? That's the million dollar question. But I don't know what the answer is for that. I just know that there's no way that that made in the USA limited hard to find strat plus or whatever guitar is going to have no value because again it's you know that's just what I think I think everything will hold some value and keep going up so Sean Brooks says same reason comic book values are not what they used to be yeah and I, I so you know we've seen things hit this look we've seen markets uh, get hurt um, my understanding is baseball cards are another industry where it's not the heyday it was, as it was. However, it's not nothing. So I understand, and again, I, I remember my my interests are only in guitars. So anything outside of that, it's just me just giving generic guesses or using as an analogy. Um, like I can imagine if you bought a comic book, you know, you know, twenty years ago or thirty years ago for you know two bucks, and and 
and it should have been worth now a grand and now it's only worth a you know, hundred bucks. You could argue it's not what it used to be, but it's still your two bucks were well served as now they're worth a hundred dollars. That's what I'm basically getting at. If you buy a, uh, if you bought a guitar, uh, a 90s era, you know, American made instrument and you have it now, and let's say you have $800 into it, where, what in 20, 30 years, what are things going to be worth? Probably more than what you paid for it. <laughs> so is that a great investment? I don't know if it's a great investment, but I don't, I can't, I don't foresee it being the, the opposite of that, but we could, we will find out <laughs> one day. All right. Um, now we have Jam Man. Jam Man says, any good affordable ABR1 bridge upgrades? Mm, I, I guess. Uh, so that question, I, I would try, Guitar Fetish is where I go for stuff like that if I'm looking for super good cheap stuff. <laughs> so I've had good luck. A couple comments on my videos over the years, you know, a few people are like, eh, not so lucky, but I think overall, I think their sentiment has been the same as me as positive. Music Therapy Last says, Phil, I'm doing my first major modification to a Strat thanks to me. Hey, thank you. It says, including a bone nut, pots, five-way super switch, jack pickups, Vega trim. Ah, oh, I love the Vega trim. And the Tessie switch. And I love the Tessie switch. Um, I was going to put a Tessie switch in that LTD guitar. I was this close. I was like, but it just seemed, it started getting obnoxious with the mods I was doing to the guitar. But I have this desire to put a Tessie switch in something. <laughs> I did it one video a couple years back. I want to do it again. Uh, so very cool. I'm glad. I'm glad uh, it's working out for you. I'm glad you're having fun. Like like I said, I, in music therapy last, I appreciate the super chat and you bringing up the subject. The reason is is because it's a nice little reminder. I love unique guitars. I say that all the time. And unique guitars to me fall into two criteria. You can buy unique guitars, which are usually expensive. So if you get to a point where you can buy these or trade up to, like my life is about trading. Right, I've traded up to everything. Everything you see behind me that's cool, I traded up to that uh, through, you know, like I said, through buying, selling, trading, you know what I mean? And you get to there, you get to a point where you, you just upgrade. Um, that's a great way to get some unique, cool guitars. However, you can mod an inexpensive guitar and make it unique. And that's what I like. I love, look, we all like cool guitars, but I love when I meet somebody and I'm like, what do you play? And they show me the guitar and I'm like, I've never seen that. Even if it's a Strat, it's a Squire Strat, it's like a Squire Strat, but they, you know, they did all these cool mods and, or they painted it or they, you know, um, uh, somebody had their, their kids uh, paint their pick guard once and it just looked really cool. And, 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 and once you heard it was their kids, you saw that already. And it obviously had this like kids did this artwork kind of thing, but it just looked cool as hell. So really cool. Uh, Joby, Joby, I'm gonna say Joby. Joby Gallagher says, what is a Tessie switch? Ah, that's a pretty good uh, question. A Tessie switch, the Tessie switch people, everybody makes a kill switch. Like I'm using my hand like this. Uh, these uh, arcade style button switches. However, um, in my experience, they were all horrible until I got my Tessie switch. Uh, every, every one of them, I, I had one once where I put it in a guitar for a customer and the customer, apparently I underestimated what you use this for. This is earlier on, uh, about 10 years ago. And they went, I want a kill switch. So I bought a kill switch. I installed in the guitar and, uh, and they go to use it. And I went, tick, 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 you know, I would kill switch like, you know, bam, 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 right. They went G -g 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 -g, <laughs> like this, their hand. And then the switch shot off like <laughs> spring hanging out like a cartoon. And the stupid button went up, hit, <laughs> didn't hit the ceiling. That would be even funnier, but it shot off. And I was like, Oh, and then we had, and that's when I, how I discovered Tessie switches uh, was later was I was looking for good quality switches. They make, uh, they make some cool stuff that light up and they get carried away with it, which is cool. But really for me, it's all about quality. They make arcade style switches. Uh, so if you want a kill switch, uh, that's like an arcade style switch, uh, you know, so, some of you guys, you've seen the Eddie Van Halen Wolfgang's, they got a kill switch right there. Um, Tessie switch, uh, good, good quality stuff for sure. For sure. I've had no issues with any of their stuff. Um, which is important. And they are also a company. In fact, I just saw Tessie Switch is here. <laughs> All right. Hi, Tessie Switch. The other thing is, I'm going to throw a little, not on the bus, just kind of say this, and I don't think you'll mind. One thing that's great about a company like Tessie Switch is it, when you email, you, you can get the owner attention, right? And, and, and you can get an answer to any situation. Uh, and, and that's great. You know what I mean? Uh, anytime you have that ability, like I talked about that earlier on the show, right? There's a difference between calling customer service, nothing wrong with that, and the person who can get something done. And so that's what's great about Tessie Switch on top of all those things I just said. But 
uh, yeah, quality stuff for sure. Oh, by the way, test switch, you can send the check right to me. Just kidding. Just kidding. Love you as always. All right, it says, uh, Jared, Jared says, hey, uh, I have a 2012 vintage modified Squire Strat. What vintage style fender bridge would fit in the body is 44 millimeters thick and the string spacing is uh, 10.5 millimeters. So yes, uh, the vintage modified Squire, I didn't remember, I've done a couple. I don't remember it being a thinner body. Um, but I will tell you this, I don't think this answer is right. <laughs> so let's start there. But I will tell you is this, I had to do, I just did this uh, a couple months ago. I had to mod up a, a Squire, was it a bullet? It might've been a bullet, but I think it was actually an affinity, but before they redesigned the affinities and when they were on thinner bodies and who had the, who had the bridge I needed was guitar fetish. So check them out. They have the, uh, the blocks that are shorter and they have the spacing that's correct. Um, the, um, the problem for stuff like that is I just measure everything and go. So a lot of times you ask me questions like this stuff and you ask me measurements. Sometimes I nail it and then sometimes I just can't remember without looking at the instrument. Um, because it gets to the point where there's so much parts now. And to be honest with you, Jared, I do a lot of searching, but there's a lot of stuff I go to. And Guitar Fetish is one of those things I've been going to for parts, for especially stuff like that. I mean, more than cable. Um, I used to love going to just eBay and getting parts. You could find any kind of part on eBay, but now you have to watch it all the time because anytime you click, if you're not paying attention, it's shipping straight from China. It takes forever. And then it's not what you wanted. I've had that problem. And then that's kind of made me kind of wean off the eBay guys a little bit, uh, the eBay auctions. It used to be like any cool part. You just go find it. It was a re great resource for that. But uh, now I'm a little more apprehensive. Uh, Tony says, what's Tony say? It says, is there a way to stiffen a Floyd Rose enough to keep the string bends from affecting the pitch of the open strings? Uh, isn't that a bridge setter? Yes, you can, you can put a trim setter on the bridge. You can, uh, get devices that do that. However, um, I also don't know in this equation if your Floyd is against the body or if it's free floating, that's going to help that. Um, but yes, you can stiffen it. Again, this kind of goes back to Michael from Big Harry Guitars question, which is when the bridge is moving. The problem he's talking about, everybody, so he, you're all on the same page. There's a thing about Floyd Rose that you that we love and some of us hate, which is when you bend, not when you use the tremolo, but when you're playing and you're bending, the bridge moves. <laughs> right? And I actually think it sounds cool. It's a thing that I, I think inherently is one of the coolest sounds of that bridge of that style bridge and a lot of trimmos do it too but floyds um but a trim setter should should correct that issue uh and if not going with a trim setter again the springs that i just suggested earlier about changing different types of tension springs will help as well but to me i think um trim setter is probably the safest fastest way to go so there you go all right um how are we doing? We're going to do kind of, there's like 1,279 of us. I uh, gonna hold on to super chats for a second and I'm gonna look for a question while I put some vodka in my cup. This is, no, I'm just kidding kids. I don't know why I'm showing you this, like proving it. Look, it's water, I promise. No, all right, um, okay. Uh, let's find a question. Remember, if you're talking to me, question mark first. Uh, this question is a fun one for me, so I hope you don't mind if I answer it. It's uh, Desert Doug. Desert Doug says, pros and cons to an attenuator versus the JHS little black box, which is something we talked about just a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Uh, it, it, I have both. I like both for different reasons. Um, to me, the attenuator, I've never loved the way any attenuator sounds. <laughs> I don't know what it is. They're just It doesn't do it. Um, and... You know, it's a necessary evil. I've said that before, too. I prefer, for some reason, I don't know what it is to my ear, but I prefer putting a master volume in effects loop of a tube amp over attenuating it. Um, that being said, sometimes when I use an attenuator, it's a convenience thing. It's about, because to me, the, the black box is two guitar cables, plug the black box in, plug it into the amp, 
kind of do your thing. The, the trick though is that, yeah, you can turn the black box basically off, you know what I mean? Or turn it to full blast, I should say, and therefore you're not attenuating the sound. And attenuation is not the right word, but you understand I'm, I'm taking the master volume out of the equation. One of the things I like about the attenuator is, especially like the rock crushers, the ones I use, that I have a bypass mode. Um, and that's because sometimes I want the amp to break up and I'm cranking it and I'm using either that extra master volume in the effects loop or the attenuator to achieve that. But sometimes I'm like, oh, in this case, I'm gonna run a pedal through that amp and I don't want it, I don't want the amp, you know, cranked. So it's all like a loud jet going by. So anyways, um, I uh, what I do is I bypass it. And so that reason I like the attenuator better. Price wise, it's, it's, it's silly. I mean, you know, 45 bucks for the black box or you can spend hundred to three hundred dollars for five hundred dollars for an attenuator, a thousand dollars. You can even tell you can get an ox for a thousand. Um, so that's that's the reasons why I would use either one. I find myself over time using the attenuator less and less. So okay. And Sean Brooks, what he's going through is he's going through the articulation of, 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 of articulating the point of the attenuator is allowing you to crank the power section. Uh, and, and instead of, like, like I said, what I'm saying is when you use the black box in the effects loop, I understand that. We all understand that. I think most of us do. Some of you probably may not understand that. Um, that's a tonal thing. But again, it's really about a practicality thing too. It's about which one do you prefer the sound of. I prefer the sound of putting a master volume in my effects loop over the attenuator in most cases. That's just what I do. I don't really I don't really buy into a lot of the power section tone. I think it's effect it has an effect, especially when the power section cranks and it distorts, especially on like a plexi. It's just not the biggest part of the equation for me. So All right. Uh, security Loft says, I have the Rock Crusher and I think it works well. I trust the Rock Crusher with everything I plug into it. So absolutely. Um, and then BB Ninja says, that's because I have the wrong attenuator. So BB Ninja, he's a moderator. I'd love to know what the right one is. What I have currently is, I have a Two Notes one, I have an Aux, I have a Behringer one, I have, an, uh, <laughs> I have a Rock Crusher, I have a Marshall, uh, what's the Marshall one called? Something. Like I have a pile of these things collected up over the years. If you watch my videos, you've seen them all. They just kind of collect up over time. Um, I like the Rock Crusher the most in the simplicity of it. Because you know what I like? I like an attenuator I don't plug in the wall. <laughs> I know the Ox gives me IRs and stuff, uh, which is why I was using it for a little while, but I switched from that very quickly. So let me know. I'll I'll try another one. Let me tell you this stuff. This is how I know it's not great, because I'm willing to try another one. <laughs> oh wait, I left out some. I was like I say, I have the Doctor Z one. Uh, two of those because they're ones behind my Doctor Z head and ones in my five uh, E three one. And then I have uh, uh, Tone King. I'm looking Tone King one. Like I have a bunch of these damn things. Um, looking for the Holy Grail one. Okay, so test switch, I love the Fry It one. I don't have the Fry It power station. Maybe that's the one I need. <laughs> I'll just keep going until I find one. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let's get to the next thing. It says, if you want to play loud, this is from Eric. If you want to play loud, you need to be loud. This is true, I guess, yeah. I, I'll be honest, I, you know, my problem now is, um, for me personally, YouTube videos are one thing, but I use, this is what I use. I use my mail-in, my mail-in plex, plexi preamp. This is it. I run this in my two notes cap. Um, I was just telling a, a good friend yesterday about this. Uh, literally, YouTube, you guys know, I, I can't use this all the time for YouTube because you guys won't relate to it. I'm like, hey, today I'm using this preamp that none of you have ever had because I know because he only makes like six of them uh, or ten of them, whatever. Uh, but I use this into my two notes, um, uh, what, cab M, into my interface in my computer, and that's what I'm using whenever I'm playing for myself. That's what I plug in when I'm playing now. 
for myself like 90% of the time and I have since I had it. I'm more than happy. So, all right, we need to get, okay, hold on, hold on a second. I got to grab, I got to get back to questions as I, again, I, sometimes when I do the re, when I re, when I timestamp all this stuff, when the, the rebroadcast happens, I get to see all your comments, which is nice, but during the show, I, I miss them. So I, I get to read the questions. Uh, let's say, uh, let's see. The next question we have is from Mad Chris to 2249. And he says, hey, Phil, could you make a video on the basics of installing pickups and go through the process? I bought a do-it-yourself guitar, and I don't know how to install. Um, yes, the question is, could I do that? And the answer is yes. Um, I, because I don't want to promise anything. Like, yeah, sure, I'll do that, and then I don't do it. Um, I'm trying to think of lo logically... Uh, how I would do it. See, the problem with installing pickups is what pickups? You know, do I do I? I got to do a video of single coils. Then I got to do one humbuckers. Then I got to do some two conductor wire, four conductor wire. Um, the, the the reality is that was the plan last year. The plan was to do execute. We we have a list of videos, and we were going to rent a space and knock out like twenty videos with a crew and do it. And COVID has made that almost impossible. And still, maybe you know what it is. That's the answer to your question, Mad Chris. I will get on the phone tomorrow and talk with the people that I was working with about how we're going to knock that out now because it's been maybe maybe it's time now that I think the now I think with the masks and all the stuff I think we can make it happen you know what I mean but that's it was a real bummer man it was like literally that's what we plan to do is execute on those because the problem when I do them by myself it's it's like when I do these uh, that's why when I'm doing these uh, repair videos uh, in the past I can't hold the camera and do the work and if I stationary set the cameras. Um, then you can't see it because it out of focuses and I'm not paying attention. I'm doing the work. And then once I figure out the footage is jacked, I already filmed it and I've already fixed the guitar. I can't, I got to unfix the guitar to fix the guitar. And I'd love to have some of my, my family members help me, but they're not really, they're not really good at that. They've tried to help me and they've done, you know, they've done the best they can. So I will uh, put that back on my to-do list because that was a big thing we were planning to do and I was excited about it. Uh, Alvaro says... Have you noticed the outrageous used price trend with basses too? Well, basses are guitars. <laughs> They're just longer with less strings. So yeah, of course. I, I I have noticed that in the idea of, yes, they're the same. Um, basses are easy for me. I told you I, I have no desire to buy a bass. I play, I have my main bass and a backup bass. And then I have, I have four basses. That's it. <laughs> four bases uh and 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 i would love to tell you that i play like these are the two i play and these are the two. i just play one i just play the one all the time it's the one i've been playing forever even my warwick the warwick behind me whoops behind me that warwick was custom made for me it's a custom made warwick spec'd out exactly to my and and it's extremely unique in a lot of its designs um and it, that's the one i use if i don't use my primary primary base which is my custom jazz deluxe from 2000 2003 so 2003 i've been playing that for 17 years so i play that one and if like i said if i don't play that i play the warwick ishinri kid says gno legacy versus 500 versus american standard okay so uh you're trying to like uh you're asking me what my thoughts are on those guitars um i well, I have American standards. I want a legacy. <laughs> there, that makes it easy. I've been looking at legacies. Um, that will probably be my next GNL is a legacy. So there, you, that's the answer to your question. It's not a great one, but it's uh, so. If, um, I probably should have told you no. The opposite of what I just said. No, American standard because I'm not going to be looking for one of those out in the market. Now we got to compete with the five that are on the market. <laughs> A shinner kit, don't worry, I'm going to buy mine new. So if you go use, you're good. If you buy new, you better get to it before me because uh, I've already put my you know, fillers out there for who's, who's willing to find me what I need uh, with stores. Uh, Frederick says, hey, Phil, what's the big difference between a Friedman and a Marshall? Um, well, it depends on the model, of course, but let's argue this in the easiest way from probably what you're asking is, you know, from practical, you know, practical play stuff. Um, I... I play Marshalls and Freedmans. I like them both. To me, Freedmans are modded Marshalls. 
I think that's what most people's takeaway is. It's all the people, all the years, all the players over the years that had their marshals modded up by all these great, you know, mod mod guys to to make them kind of more ferocious. You know what I mean? Kind of a little bit more kick, a little bit of distortion. Uh, they do that. There's something about the Freedmans that I like in the way that they sound. They have the classic Marshall vibe, but they're not Marshalls. They have this their own thing, and I like it. However, uh, you know, I like Marshalls too. That's why I have a. I'm looking at it right now. I have a 1980 something. <laughs> I have a Plexi. I can't remember what it is. It's 89? Is that the 1989? Anyways, I have a Plexi. I have a JMP. I have a bunch of Marshalls that I love, and I love them because they're not Freedmans, and I like my Freedmans because they're not Marshalls. So uh, the main question to this, uh, our main answer I want to give you is this, is um, here's the thing I can't, I can't, I can't do myself. So maybe this is where your problems have too. I want a Freedman that satisfies the Marshall itch. And I would like a Marshall that satisfies the free, Freedman itch. In other words, you know, it'd be nice to have one and not all the ones I have. And at this point, for some reason, I either feel this need to play through the old old Marshall but or the Freedman. The only thing I will tell you is I have no desire to own any modern Marshalls because all modern Marshalls to me, I like the Freedmans better. Just my ears, my preference, what I like. So, and I have a, a, a Dirty Shirley. Dirty Shirley to me has the plexi vibe, but it's again, more aggressive. Throatier, bassier, more aggressive, different sound. It's different. It sounds like a different amp to me. It vibes like that Marshall, but it's not the same thing. So, um, so that's my horrible example, what's different about them. But that's what I think they're different, is that the, the Freemans are more hot-rotted Marshalls, and there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good things about that. Benjamin says, new Fender player Stratocaster HSS, okay, humbucker single single, G-string is constantly out of tune. I've checked intonation and it's all good. Any suggestions? So my guess is your G-string is binding in the nut. That's probably why it's constantly out of tune. It's good that you've identified that that's the string because a lot of players will say that the guitar is going out of tune. But uh, I've, as, as I've pointed out many times in the past, when somebody says their guitar goes out of tune, I'm always like, what strings, <laughs> right? If it's all of them, yeah, we have a problem. If it's one or two of them, then we know where to, to start the, the, you know, the fix. In your case, it's real simple. It's the G string. My guess is, look, all the strings are returning back to, to the same pitch correctly because that's why you've identified the G string as the one that's falling out of tune. So the bridge is not likely the culprit because it's returning back. There is a couple things I want you to check, though, and they're going to be silly. First thing, always check this is uh, just silly, but go in the back of the string uh, with the block for the tremolo and take a flashlight and look inside the hole of the G string and make sure there's not another string in there. That happens. Sometimes you think the string fell out and you put the new string in and now you've smashed that ball end into another ball end and it's just in there and that could be a problem. So make sure that area is clear. That is the only thing that the bridge can be doing if only one string is going out of tune and the other five are staying in tune. Now that we've, once you've satisfied that that is not the problem with the bridge, now we want to talk about the nut. You have to make sure that the slot on the G string is cut correctly and smooth. And then if it's fine, then check the tuning key to make sure that it's holding its, it's doing its job. And so, and like I said, break it down into the steps that way. So there you go. Also, and if none of that works, make sure, and this is because, again, you're, you know, I, I don't have a follow-up, you know, banter with you guys. Um, if we were talking, just talking and not a question where I'm answering a question, one of the things uh, we'd be talking about also is, uh, did, is this a problem that followed the strings? In other words, if you have an issue like that and you change the strings and it's happening to the new set of strings, then we've at least eliminated that. So another thing I have to eliminate is, is it that string? You know what I mean? It could be bad. Strings are bad. Sometimes they're defective. A string can be defective for sure. Um, so I also would want to make sure that you're this, you've at least since this problem, after you tried those symptoms or those things to correct the symptom, if that didn't correct it, you may need to change your strings to make sure it's not the string. If you change the string, then, then, you know, those symptoms are the focus either way, either way. That's what, uh, that's what you have to focus on. Okay. So, where are we at? Frederick? No, we've already, gone, we've already gone that way. We're looking at Felicity. Felicity says, hey, Phil, what are your thoughts on the DiMaggio, Joe Saturani, Saturani, Satch track? This stuff, this stuff is like a 
tongue twister. Phil, what are your thoughts? They're, they're my thoughts. On a DiMarzio, Joe Saturani, Satch Track, or Mojo Pickups? I, if I've played them, it's always in passing. For DiMarzio, I have, uh, my favorite pickups from DiMarzio are um, the Gravity. I like that one. I like the PAF. I like the uh, Tone Zone. I like the Super Distortion. These are all ones I have in guitars. So I'm just telling you good pickups I put in guitars I have in guitars. Um, the, um, the Andy Timmons, the Air Norton. So I'll do an Andy Timmons and Air Norton in a set of guitars. I like that. I just recently did that for a lot of reasons. Um, and uh, for the mini humbucker pickups, from, uh, I use the chopper. No particular reason. I just like it. I have a bunch, and I've tried the Fast Track, Fast Track 2. You know, right? I just like the chopper. And then it's driving me crazy. Fortitude. That's the one I use the most. So I fell in love with a pickup called the Fortitude. And that's when I use the most now from, from DiMarzio. That's when I have that in guitars, not only in the bridge position, even though it's a bridge pickup, I have it in the bridge and neck positions of guitars. Those are the ones I like. Um, but I'm a DiMarzio pickup fan, just like, you know, because, I mean, they've been around forever and I've used them all, but I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of experience with the Saturani uh, pickups. I like his ear. I like his tone. Even on the album where he had the PV and it was a little fizzy for me, I still like that tone. It was it was muddy and weird and fun, but man, I like his tone. Because he's always sounded like he's got an angry Strat. That's what I like about Joe's tone. It always sounds like a really aggressive Strat tone, like a modernized Strat tone. Okay, uh, Diddy Obe. <laughs> sure. I have no idea how even close that. D-I-D-I-O-B. Diddy O-B. Diddy O-B says, Hey, Phil, first time I catch the show live. Awesome. Thank you for joining. Uh, greetings from Germany. You make my long nights uh, with the baby girl sh shorter. That's awesome. I think you appreciate that. Um, keep on the good work. Have you tried Nick Uber guitars? I have. When I was in Germany, I got to play a bunch I forget what music store we were in. There's a bunch of us. We got to go in a private room. Uh, we mean customers. You know, they had a private room for his, uh, Nick Huber guitars. Um, fantastic. Uh, fantastic guitars. Yeah. They're the guy, look, those are the guitars you play and you go, yeah, yeah. If I had six grand, I'd buy it. <laughs> seven. I think it was seven. Whatever it was, it was like, yes, you could have my money. If I had the money to give you, Nick, you could have it. <laughs> And I would take your guitar, but I didn't have that kind of money for those kind of guitars. Um, I would put him on a very short list of, let's say, um, oh, maybe that'd be a fun video to make. Like five guitars I would buy over $5,000. Like if I could buy them, what would I buy? What guitar, what five brands would I buy a more than $5,000 guitar from? He would be one. He would be on the list. Now, the question is, where on that five? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. But he's on the, he's on the five list, for sure. Um, of the imaginary guitars that I literally cannot buy because I can't buy a five seven thousand dollars guitar. <laughs> I just can't do it. Like I said, it doesn't matter. If I won the lottery tomorrow, you know, when somebody's like, hey, if you won the lottery, would you buy it? No, I can't do it. I can't own a $7,000 guitar. It does, it's mentally impossible for me to, to own it. <laughs> Well, let me put it this way, and so because I don't want to ever confuse any of you, okay, uh, and, and, and for a lot of reasons. Probably behind me, I haven't even looked. I own seven thousand dollar guitars. I just didn't pay that. I, I have a couple five thousand dollars. I have an eight thousand dollar guitar. I don't know what it's worth right now. Probably close to eight. I didn't pay anything close to that. Like I said, um, I have a guitar I paid uh, nineteen hundred for, for, and I know for a fact it's worth six or seven right now. I have a guitar I paid. Uh, 16, I know it's worth six. So I'm not saying um, <laughs> I can own an expensive guitar. I just can't buy it. I don't know what it is. It's like it's like handing over that much money. I, I bought my most expensive guitar I've ever bought in my life last year for my birthday. And I unloaded, as I told you, 19 guitars last year. And I I mean, it took, it took like six or seven of those guitars to buy this one guitar. And I bought it. And I don't regret it. But I will never buy a guitar that expensive again or anything more than expensive than that. And the reason is, is because one reason, one reason only. I love it. I'm happy. However, 
I don't love it any more than a guitar. My favorite, here's my, oh, actually, here's, maybe you guys will relate to this. Besides Nathan's guitar, which is right there, the one he made for me, okay? Um, and I say that because, you know, obviously he's a good friend, and that's a beautiful guitar, and I'm lucky to have it. Other than the guitar that Nathan made for me, my two favorite guitars, I paid less than $900 for. Literally, if I only had two guitars, I'd take those two guitars, besides Nathan's guitar, because he's my good friend who made me this amazing guitar. But I'm saying money, what I paid for. The two guitars that I love, out of all the guitars I own, I, I am into them for 900 bucks each. 919 for one and 950 for the other is what I paid. And that was years ago. And so it's hard to fall in love guitars two, three, four, five times that when I, no matter how many times of those guitars I buy, I still don't love more than the guitars I invested 900 bucks into. And as a YouTuber that reviews gear, I'm constantly picking up five to $700 guitars in these reviews where I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> like I can't, I can't justify it. Uh, so that's where I'm at mentally. It's all mental. So like I said, I don't want you to confuse that with money because like I said, so when somebody's like, but what if you win the lottery? Same thing. Uh, I, I'll guarantee you this. And I know for a fact, I can add for a lot of reasons. If I had a million dollars right now in my bank account, before I would buy an $8,000 guitar, I would buy myself two $2,000 guitars. And then I'd probably, because if money didn't matter, I'd just donate $4,000 to some charity. And it's not to like, hey, I'm a good guy, pat me on the back. It's just, I'd probably enjoy that more. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, for some reason, I just can't, like I said, I can't get there. But I have tons of friends, including lots of viewers like you. Man, you guys can shuck down $10,000 guitars, $8,000 guitars all day long. God bless you. I'm happy for you. I, I, again, you know, who, who wouldn't be happy for someone who can afford a nice guitar, right? And, you know, obviously you're doing something good or right or lucky, all of the above. But... It's just not where I'm at. So the Nick Uber guitar, same thing. I love his guitars and I pick them up. And if there was anything I was going to justify that price point, it'd be one of his guitars <laughs> for sure. So uh, that's why you don't see more nags in my collection. That's that's the thing. I just can't do it. It's too much. Um, <laughs> Fox with a W Fox in the Hound says if I had $5,000 I'd buy the Glary Guitar Company <laughs> uh, I just laughed I like the joke I appreciate the humor <laughs> that's a lot of Glary guitars by the way <laughs> so yeah um, um, uh, Chronicle uh, Cultivation says the Framus I like is over $6,000 yeah they're crazy expensive and I've ne and I've never I've I feel I've never hit this form you guys before and I won't obviously because you guys saw when I bought my Framuses I bought my Framuses because I went to Germany and the Framus guys made me a deal, and that's how I bought my Framuses they gave me a deal, <laughs> that's how I was able to own them. Otherwise, yeah, same thing. Like I, I'm again I'm not soliciting in any way because again because it's, it's still no matter how what I got to spend it's my money right. But I'm saying if Nick Uber was like hey Phil I'll send you a guitar and I'll give you a smoking deal and here's the deal, that's when I would buy one. You know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, or if I found the right one at the right deal. Like I said, I, I can find a deal on something I want. That's my problem. I know if I wait. And and very clear, when I say I bought a guitar last year, it's the most expensive guitar I bought. I bought that guitar as a smoking deal. Like That was an opportunity buy, too, as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eric Nelson says, Nielsen might be Nielsen, Nielsen, Eric Nielsen says, what music do I listen to? Uh, is it, is it, isn't it hard to turn off the analytic, analytic mind? Um, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, so I'll go backwards. Uh, turning off my mind, chilling out. The only thing that's tough is look, the saying of, of, uh, you know, if you love what you do, you never work another day in your life. Um, that's, that's probably true. <laughs> What I tell people is, if you turn the thing you love into a job, you've now turned the thing you love into a job. <laughs> That's where I live now. I live in the, uh, this was my dream. I, I, I'm sorry, it just is. It was my dream to be around guitars all day and play guitars all day and own guitars. And I'm not a cool guitar player. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have it, nor did I ever have it. <laughs> I never had whatever it is that you need to do that. Um, and... Uh, so long story short, I found a way to be around guitars all day through my music store, through a pair, through now the YouTube, I find a way to, to, to be around this. I can't afford, like I said, I can't afford these crazy expensive guitars. 
so I learned how to obtain them through through this trading, through you know collecting, through this journey of mine, um, through repairing them, right, finding the right deal and then repairing one. Um, so uh, that being said, my problem is never turning off an analytic mind. My problem is my job and my passion are now aligned. So sometimes it's hard for me to figure out when I'm working and when I'm having fun. My wife, luckily, luckily is my anchor for that. Sometimes she'll look at me and goes, you need to stop working. I go, I'm not working. I'm looking at this guitar and doing this thing. She's like, yeah, for what? And I go, for this video I'm going to do. And she's like, that's working. Please, you know, calm down. So, uh, so that's the only thing I have to do is I have to kind of center myself. Um, I got the best advice ever off of a video from uh, Steve, who's uh, a guitar samurai. I really apologize right now. I don't know if it's samurai guitarist or guitar samurai. If I get it wrong, his name's Steve, and he's awesome. But, <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, he, on his channel, he said, in this world of what we do, uh, content creating, and of course the other, you know, my other jobs, uh, he said, you don't plan work time; you plan off work time, and that was the best advice for me. So that's what I do. I actually. I don't set when I work because I assume I just work all the time. I set when I don't work. That's the best advice I got. If that helps you guys out there, especially during COVID, working from home, best advice you could ever get. You don't set your work time. You set your not working time because otherwise you'll always be somehow working. So that that's the answer to that part of the question. The, what music do I listen to? It depends on my mood and I go through phases. Uh, I've been in a country phase for a while. So this is about two months of country music maybe because I'm sad in the house and COVID and just like want to listen to guys sing about their dogs but <laughs> so kind so i go through all kinds of phases so i'll be like country music and i'm i'm a binger uh so so whatever it is okay i don't care what it is uh, it's i'm a binger of everything so if i'm into something i can't stop that thing so if i like a show i binge watch the whole show if i like a restaurant if i if I, my wife takes me to a new restaurant i want to go there the, three times in the next month <laughs> right to the point where all my friends are like we we don't want to go there anymore i'm like oh it's the best place to go until i'm sick of it i binge until i'm sick of it so same thing with music i binge um you know uh, i'll binge like uh rock i'll go into rock or i'll like def leppard or like punk rock or uh metal whatever it is i binge it until i can't stand it anymore and then i go to the next genre so i'm binging so lately it's been country and i've been slowly coming out of country uh and going into this weird Def Leppard phase because <laughs> I watched the Hysteria documentary that's free on uh, uh, Amazon Prime, and uh, I highly recommend that I, uh, if you if you get a chance to watch it. Uh, so, there, by the way, Robert Baker's in the house. I saw his sign on. He says, I, "I love my cheap guitars, but my Sir Classic Five always wins, uh, not because it's expensive, because it's uh, great." But that's the thing. See, that that's it, Robert put it perfectly. It, it, see what he said? It's not. It didn't win because it's expensive, or it's good, or it's built better. He just there doesn't have to be a logical connection. He just loves it because it's great. I'm sure he's implying the quality is good, but I've played guitars that are super great quality, but just don't do it for me. So that's why I said it's tough. Um. <laughs> Sean Brooks, uh, Sean's always, it seems like it's, today you're winning, buddy. You got like the most, uh, you grab my attention with your comments. Since I feel like expensive guitars are easier to justify than expensive amps. Once you pass the two, K, uh, two grand range in amps, it seems to be a waste. I don't, I, that's not an inaccurate statement by any means, but I, I feel like the problem for amps, expensive amps for me, is when I see a, you know, let's say a $3,000 guitar. Okay, we're just going to, because we're going to stick with crazy numbers. I see a guitar, it's like, okay, that's expensive, uh, but I play it, I can play it just as much as I can play any other guitar. When I see a $3,000 amp, it's usually because it's loud, <laughs> right? So like a good example, I don't, I don't have, a, I have the uh, Freeman Dirty Shirley Mini. I, I like it. I've told you guys up front. I like the twin sister or the full size Dirty Shirley more. I like the, I think the small box 50 is where I want. That's the amp I probably want the most. However, it's not the $2,800. That's crazy expensive. But as you've seen with guitars, I can do the same with amps. I can offset, you know, two, three of these amps and sell them off and get that. The problem for $2,800 for that amp, it's not the price, although that's expensive. It's the, I don't need 50 watts. So if I buy the amp, I'll never use it to its justified purpose. So yeah, that's my problem with expensive amps. A lot of times it's hard to justify because you're not going to use it. A expensive guitar, it's not like I'm going to like, well, I'll use the guitar, but I'll never play all six strings, only three of them. You know what I mean? So it's a little different that way. That's at least my thought on it. 
Okay, so, um, all right, let me go back to, how are we doing? We're doing, we're at the, let me, let me find the last super chat so I can. Doby Doss, Doby Doss, you're the last super chat. It's like, it feels like today's been the who's who of YouTubers. I saw Shane in the Blues. I saw American Musical Supply, Musical Supply, AMS. I saw um, Robert Baker. I saw uh, Tessie Switch. I saw Aaron. I, I, I saw a lot, like this is, wow, this is great. Thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate it. It feels good. I have to go visit now your live shows. Say hi. Okay, so uh, next we have, um, who do we have? We have Grumpy Mike Guitar. Grumpy Mike Guitar says, for the tone jar, and why not? By the way, I liked your piece on Shane's In the Blues video disclosure. Uh, paid promotion is super important. I get no credit for that. That was Shane 100%. Shane uh, reached out, obviously, to us, but to me, and said, hey, would you mind making a clip? And this is why. And, um, you know, it, it's a funny subject. I know it fires all up everybody. You know, you're always going to get the... The Internet's always so happy and so pleased to talk about a subject. Anyways, um, I, I looked at it and I think Shane was 100% right in wanting to do the video. It's not a who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth thing is, does anyone even know? You know what I mean? Does people even know they have to do this stuff? Um, and uh, my thing, and I've said this before in a broken record, my thing is always, uh, if I don't buy it, I just want you to know that's why you know, I never felt, I felt, haven't felt the sting of the wallet. You know what I mean? The losing of the money. Um, same thing with the Nick Uber guitar. Perfect example. If he was, if I got a discount on one and I did a video, I'd have to not only legally disclose it to you that, you know, he's the guitar, but I'd want to tell you so that you know that when you spend your seven grand on that guitar, that although I love the guitar, I didn't. You know, you know what I mean? That's a big deal. It's a big deal because you want to know how far is someone willing to go. Um, and I think that, I think that says a lot. Um, and, uh, and I think we've, I think we, I think we're killing it. I think as a as a YouTube channel, uh, network of channels out there, I think as a whole, uh, I don't know what the percentage is. It feels like everybody, you know, right. There's a few channels that still, for some reason, don't disclose certain things. And the million dollar question is, do they not know or do they not care? And it's not about outing them. It's about just like, hey, everybody, this is what everybody has to say and do. So I thought it was a cool video. If you haven't seen it, I'll make sure I'll put a link in the description to it. It's a video that Shane from In the Blues, which is a great channel, please check it out, made with Robert Baker, uh, the Tone King, and anybody I don't mention I feel bad about, but, you know, just give highlight. Henning, of course, you know, right, uh, and me, and um, giving our two cents on uh, the ethics of disclosing, not the legality. We know it's the law. What is the ethical part of that? And why do you do it? You know what I mean? Um, and that I thought that was insightful too, because obviously, you know, uh, saying you don't speed because it's the law doesn't really say you agree with the law. It just says you do it because it's the law. I, I'd like to tell you this. If there was no law to disclose anything on YouTube, I would disclose everything like I am now. I'd be on the, sh I'd be, look, and there's a penalty to this, by the way. The penalty is the other way. And I'll get off this high horse. I literally have a list now this long on my arm. I could tattoo it on my arm. And one day if I'm ever crazy, maybe I will. I could tattoo all the companies that won't work with me now because of the things I've said on YouTube. So anyone who ever argues that, hey, you can say whatever you want, you can, but to say that the companies aren't paying attention. So it it's not that people, it's, for me, it's not that people should say whatever they want. It's maybe as a community, it's nice to acknowledge when people do say what they want because there is a punishment to this. I'm not going to ever lie and say, I can say what I want in there. Who cares? It's not who cares. I got a list this long, of small, small names of companies that literally will never talk to me, send me product, work with me in any way because of something I said. And that to me, uh, that's my uh, reason why when I tell you why, why I disclose, I, I want uh, you to understand that there's a little bit of pain in that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Ibanez is happy that I did correct the fret sprout on that guitar this week. Uh, I haven't talked to them. They're usually good guys with me, you know, but I don't know. But let me tell you, I if they never talk to me again, I wouldn't be shocked. And if they talk to me, I'll be happy. But what I'm saying is I knew when doing that, not disclosing because I bought that guitar. There's nothing to disclose. Think about this. That was an unsponsored video that required no disclosure. 
But yet I've had so many videos that aren't sponsored that I paid my own money that pissed off a company and they won't work with me now. <laughs> so so uh, that tirade is over. But again, I, I, I like that we're at least talking about it as a, as a, uh, as a uh, community because um, I think uh, um, one thing I'm going to start doing, this is probably a cool, cool thing uh, if you guys are interested. I, I have this idea. I got the idea uh, recently. I thought it would be fun. From now on in my videos, uh, I don't know if you know this, but if you put a uh, comment in my video with a link, YouTube filters that out. So if you were to put a, a, a comment in my video, any of my videos, and it's most of the channels are like this. If you put a comment with a link to, let's say, your video or to some other website or something, um, it doesn't get banned or blocked. It goes into this like filtered section where I have to approve it personally because obviously, you know, some people put all kinds of creepy stuff, <laughs> right? There's all kinds of weird, inappropriate websites that get linked. And so what I'm going to start doing on the channel now is soliciting small channels that review or have opinions about products I reviewed. Uh, if you if you post a uh, a link to your video, I'll make sure it's not blocked and it's posted. So there you go. I thought it'd be fun. So that's that's the uh, that's the idea. All right. Next question. Where are we at? Next question is from S H. Says, why isn't the four way wiring standard in tellies? It seems like such a small addition uh, that would make the telly that much better and make Fender money. Um, Yes and no. So, so what he's talking about, or what they're talking about, is you can add a four-way switch to a Telecaster, and it will give you a fourth option, which is a, a, a an out of phase. I think it's out of phase. I can't remember. It depends on how you wire it. Anyways, you get in phase, out of phase kind of logic, um, and it gives you more punchy mids. It's a little more nasally, very country kind of vibe. Very cool. I have it in one of my tellies. Don't have it in another for that reason. I don't want it in one of my tellies and I wanted it in one other one. So I think their main reason it's not standard is for that reason. It's a more expensive switch. It takes an extra second to wire it. You have to make sure the pickups are are able to do that, which most of them are, but you can't have like a non-covered neck pickup to it um, without a little bit of trouble. And not everybody would want it or care. I see your point that it's a good feature and if you don't want it, don't use it. But this is not an industry of giving the customer more than what they ask for. <laughs> All uh, vintage guitars, right? Making stuff, you know, as bare minimum as you can. Um, Red Yamaha bass guy. Hey, it's nice to see you again. I remember because I remember last time I was like, hey, he likes Red Yamaha basses or hates them. Uh, any input on tightening a vintage Morley treadle? Um, uh, so he's talking about obviously on the Morley... Uh, well, he didn't say wah, but they have a volume in wah. Uh, I I thought it's two nuts on each side, and you tighten them, right? I've used I've used a wrench and got in there on mine. I don't have a vintage one. You said vintage, right? Vintage Morley treadle. I have. I don't know if it's vintage. I have like the big style ones from the '80s, and I tighten them by using two wrenches. Stick them in there and just do it like that. <laughs> Probably not the best answer for you, but uh, if it doesn't have that, what I can tell you is the Morley guys are very helpful if you contact them. They'll actually respond. Another, again, small company, still making their stuff in the United States, still still take the time to answer questions from customers that reach out because there's a small amount of people. Uh, Paul says, gigging, gigging valve amp with tremolo and reverb clean to breaking up with a drummer type volume. Think the deluxe reverb is my ticket. Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> Talk about it. just confirmation. Yes. I love my Deluxe Reverb. Literally, I feel like I could gig with that amp anywhere ever, period. And exactly that. I can keep it clean with a little bit of, you know, putting in input two. It does great. Put in input one, crank it a little bit, get the breakup. Absolutely love it. Ace. Ace. A-E-S. Ace. Ace Klee says, on a previous live chat, I asked uh, about a taper switch on Ernie Ball vo volume pedal, junior pedal. What would be, what would be the musical or rig setup application in changing the taper on the volume pod? pod? Uh, so okay, let's get back. To, let's get to the core of that because that's one of those questions where it can get confusing. So a volume pedal is more than just two things. Well, it's. it's Two basic functions. Obviously, some people just use it to turn off the sound, so they can change guitars, or it's a set list break, and they want to take a break. 
Um, some of them use it for swells, you know what I mean? But some of them use it like to get these violin effects and they use it like a, uh, an effect like that up and down. So that's why you would change out the potentiometers for those reasons because you may want to change the way that uh, that happens, you know what I mean? Especially if you want the swell to be more consistent across or if it just happens towards the end. Um, I've never changed mine out, like I said before. I like it the way its stock is, but uh, changing it out usually has, the application has to do with how why you're going to use it and usually depends on how ex, uh, responsive you want the volume pedal to be that's probably the best way to put this is the reason you would change it out is because sometimes you don't care you just off on and somewhere in between like some some people use it to um if i use a volume pedal and i very rarely do if i do uh my my ernie ball i use it to actually the same way i would use my volume on my guitar i just use it to set the gain on an amp so let's say i have an amp with a lot, a lot of gain and it's one channel or i'm going to just use one channel i'll set the gain and then i use the volume pedal to back the gain off you know and clean up so i don't really care how expressive that is all the way in between because i'm just going to set it in a spot but like i said if i'm doing these kind of cool swells and fast picking you may want that to be really really responsive nick says phil do you have any acoustics if not why uh, will you do some maintenance videos with acoustics? Sure, I did a couple videos with acoustics. I'll do some more. Um, this thing is always a funny thing. So yes, I have acoustics. I have some Taylors. I have a Martin. I have a Arts and Luthery. I have a uh, 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 a uh, uh, the one I just reviewed. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Lag. I have a lag. Um, mostly I play the Martins and the Taylors. Uh, it depends on what I'm up to at the time. I mostly play acoustic. <laughs> so yeah, the acoustics are like basses. Look, I love guitars. That's obvious. So it's easy thing to talk about. I repair guitars like my repair days, basically all guitars, very few basses, some acoustics last week. Uh, this week I should say I was one Martin, one Taylor and one Yamaha acoustic. So three acoustic guitars total for the week. Usually it's more, sometimes it's less, depends on, but it's always more electric than acoustics as a whole, because I don't do a whole lot of cheap repairs anymore. So uh, cheap, meaning cheap guitars. A lot of my clients don't bring me, you know, $50 guitars anymore. Um, so uh, so anyways, that being said, uh, it's, yeah, it's as simple as when I make acoustic videos, they get a lot less views and less, a lot less interaction. So I, I don't think to make them as much. When somebody mentions like you, I, if you ever notice, every one of these live shows, anytime somebody mentions something like you are, and then you'll notice I pick up on it a little bit again. Because again, it's not my focus is on the views. My focus is on like interest. Does anyone care? So a lot of times you guys mention this stuff, it's huge to me because I always assume that lower views and lower view times is lack of interest. But then I forget that, yeah, maybe as a whole, the whole community doesn't care and the overall views are less, but the people who watch engaged and loved it. So yeah, of course. Um, Ollie Richards says, got a player Mustang delivered today. I love it, but it has a small gap under one of the frets. Ooh. And at the edge of the fretboard. Did it just jump on me? It did. Sorry, buddy. Okay. Uh, under the fretboard, it plays great. Is it okay? Uh, yes. And here's where it gets tricky. So the gap. When you see a gap under a fret, that happens sometimes, right? You see a gap under the fret. And the problem is if you don't have a dead note or a problem around that fret, it gets a little scary because usually when I see that, I want to tap it down. That's the first thing I want to do. You take a fret hammer, I'll tap it down. And the problem is once I tap it down, then I will have a dead note and dead fret. The issue you have is this. You may not have a problem now, but eventually you could have a problem because it can continue to lift. Or through playing it, you could push it down. That's the problem having a gap. It's it's a it's obviously a sign of it's a defect. So you got the guitar today, okay? So now that's what you have to decide. If you're not having any playing issues, that's fine. But it's not about whether or not you should send the guitar back or keep it. It's you have to decide now that you've examined it. Remember I talked about diagnosing a problem. You saw the problem. If you're not has if it doesn't have the problem right now, it may. You need to be mentally prepared for the fact that in a month. In a year, in five months, you might need some kind of uh, setup work or fret work done to that guitar because of that issue. It is possible. And it's just as easy, it's just as possible that that fret never moves. What I will tell you is please don't stick glue in it. <laughs> I just had that happen two months ago with a customer and it was horrifying for me to fix. They did exactly that. They had a gap and they wouldn't have any dead notes and they thought, you know what, fix that. And they shot some super glue in there. And uh, that doesn't fix it. <laughs> That's what they learned. Um, so 
that's what I would do is, is think about that. Think about whether you want to exchange it now because it, even though it doesn't have a problem, it potentially can. Or like I said, you have to you have to acknowledge the fact that you might need repair in the future. If you're prepared for that, it's fine. What do I think that repair will cost? Anywhere between $50 to $100. So there's a good estimate. I know I caught, by the way, uh, that you paid me in uh, GBP. So um, I know it's different where you live. I don't know what the rates are. So you would have to look at the current rates where you're at. But here, here where I live, 50 to 100 bucks is what something like that would cost. Angela says, what does Angela say? She says, uh, Angela says, Phil, I have seen, I have seen the sawtooth hybrid guitars. Okay. Two humbuckers and three single coils. I saw the guitar too. Michelangelo Badio design. Check them out. LOL. Um, I, I just saw that guitar a couple weeks ago. Check it out. You know what? I saw tooth is another brand that gets mentioned a lot. Probably see it on the channel. Um, the, uh, like I said, there is no, no anymore on the channel. So if there's any guitar, well, especially if there's not, if you're not talking about crazy price guitars, but, uh, the way we're doing the guitars now, it's working out, which is, you know, uh, we'll buy, you know, if somebody sends out a guitar, that's great. If they want to work with us, that's great. If a company doesn't want to work with the channel, we'll just buy the guitar. Cause that's based on what you guys suggest. So when you guys suggest guitars, um, the, uh, and right now what I'm doing is the, the patrons suggest guitars and I'm just doing the guitars. The patrons suggest cause I got to get that, that deep into it. But then as we satisfy those, we're going to do the others. Sawtooth is one of the ones that came up. So that might be the way I go with that because uh, no, one says, no one said specific what Sawtooth guitar to talk about. Lidface says, watching tomorrow. <laughs> Jumped in to get someone else's question answered. Uh, loved the 565 review. That and the Koa Red Beach model was my teenage dream. Yeah, the Koa Red Beach model was like four or $5,000 now for that guitar. Crazy money. Crazy. I am very, very happy with my RG565. I don't know, and I hope it did come across that I love that guitar in the video. There was a problem. Obviously, I corrected it. I love the guitar. Um, I'm very happy. As you guys know, I had an RG, I have an RG565 reissue that I, I liked, but I didn't buy it because I wanted it. I wanted something like this. This is the guitar I've always kind of wanted. Uh, I don't really care about the orange. That's not what I want. It's the design. I love this design. I'd love it even more if it had no neck pickup. <laughs> just one pickup like that. That's the perfect guitar for me for an Ibanez. Just some shredder, one pickup. Ibanez guitar would be fun. Um, so so cool. I'm glad you liked the video. I had a lot of fun because uh, uh, it was a guitar. It was like an exciting guitar for me to check out and, and get. <laughs> and so like I said, that's why I bought it. Um, so uh, basically, let's do a question because he... Sometimes this people super chat and then we want to hit a non super chat question. Top Low Telly says, I've decided on ordering a PRS SE hollow body to Piazzo, uh, Piazzo Black Burst. I'll stop doing that. Uh, Black Burst uh, Gold, which is the one I reviewed. Uh, what do you think of it for 1550? Look, they sent that guitar. I love that guitar. I love it. It's so good. I absolutely hate that it's $1,500 and made in China. I, I hate it. I, I'm sorry if that dates me. I don't know if that's like, uh, there's no particular reason for, I don't have any agenda behind that statement other than, yeah, <laughs> I don't like it. I want it to be made in, for $1,500, I want it to be made in Korea. I don't know why. It just seems like it justifies the price better. Um, I, I think I said this to you guys before. I'll say it again. They sent that guitar. I sat on it for three months. And it won me over. That's how good it is. That being said, I never paid $1,500 for it. In fact, uh, they left it with me. I still have it. So um, uh, that's the only thing I can't tell you. That's the whole point of that review. I can tell you it's good. I can tell you that I like it. I can tell you that it sounds great. I can tell you the case is cool. I can't tell you what it's worth because I didn't pay for it. Fifteen hundred bucks. It's a lot of bucks. Uh, I can tell you what I would pay for it. Thousand bucks. That's what I would pay. Like if, like if they let me give you an example. If they uh, sent me an email, as sometimes it happens, and they say, "Hey Phil, thanks for the video." Um, you can send the guitar back now. 
Um, in this situation, what happened was I didn't ask for the guitar. They sent it and I didn't ask for a, uh, I, that's what happens. Sometimes you ask, a, you know, some kind of accommodation on that, that in this particular case with them, with Jean at PRS, they sent the guitar. I had every intention to send it back. I had no interest in it. In fact, when she told me, she's like, we're sending you this $1,500 made in China hollow body. I was like, all right, I'll do a video because I'm interested to check it out. But I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a buyer is what I'm trying to say. Um, and uh, long story short, uh, they uh, didn't want it back. So I got to keep it. Very cool, cool benefits sometimes the channel. Sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes, like I said, guitars go back. Sometimes you have to, you know. But what I can tell you with honesty is if they would have said, Gene would have said, hey, can you send the guitar back? I would have said, hey, I kind of want to keep it. I really like it. What's my price? And mentally, if she said a thousand bucks, I'd be on. I would say, yes, I'll take it. If she would have said thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars, I'd be like, I'll think about it. <laughs> and then you probably so so that's your my answer to you. I would buy it for a thousand. You have to decide if it's worth it to you for the extra five fifty. But my 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 guess to you is, since you're smart enough to watch this channel, uh, I I've got call, get on the phone, get somebody to give you a deal, get it for fifteen shipped to your house, no tax, you know something. There's a deal, find it. Uh, that would be my suggestion, unless you really love it. That's like I said, the the money thing is for every person to decide for themselves. I can only tell you my opinion. Please don't, you know. Make your own opinion <laughs> on the price. Let me know though if you end up paying, you know, if you buy it in your full price, and let me know. I'm curious, um, but I can tell you this: I don't think they cherry picked me the guitar. I don't feel that way. Um, I don't think they had any to cherry pick at the time. I think they shipped me one, and it's legit the way it was. And I've had two patrons and two friends buy one since, and they say the same thing. So it's always nice when you hear the confirmation the other way too. You know what I mean? I get confirmation just like you guys. I say something and you're like, good, I'm glad he thinks that because I was curious. I sometimes like to hear from you guys when you're like, I got it, Phil, and it wasn't great or it's a great, uh, you know what I mean? It's nice. Um, uh, Arthur Jett says, how often do you think people sell off their favorite guitar simply because it fell out of setup? I've been guilty of that in the past. Look, that's what's, that's one of the core things that made me start videos like this, the repair type videos. We would we would see that in the store. Somebody would buy a guitar, usually from Guitar Center. Again, I don't want to pigeonhole those guys because everybody's guilty of something. But it would come from Guitar Center and it was jacked up setup wise. And the employee of Guitar Center let it go through. I know, it's not, I feel bad talking smash the Guitar Center. But in my case, it was Guitar Center. So that's why I want to reference that. Um, so what happened was they would bring it to the store. And instead of saying, hey, I need this set up. They would say, "I would you take this on trade? It doesn't work for me. It plays horrible. I need to play." And they and they would always. It was always the same scenario. They wouldn't bring the guitar in. What they would do is come in our store, pick up some guitars on the wall, play one, leave, come back hours later, days later, with their guitar and say, "I played that guitar on the wall. It plays great. I want to trade this in towards it." And luckily, hopefully, most of the time we would catch that. We would go. What don't you like about this guitar is great. You don't like this? I think in one case, somebody brought me like a USA Strat that they just bought. And they're like, it plays horrible. And, and I'm like, why? And I played it and I go, oh, yeah, you need a setup. And they didn't know what that was. And then you tell them like, oh, yeah. At that time, I think it was probably 60, 70 bucks for a setup. So 60 bucks will make this play as great as the one on the wall or better. So to answer your question, how often does it happen? I don't know how often, but I know it happens because I've seen it firsthand in many cases. So yes, that is where, and look, and then, and then of course, from that, I can trans, I can translate that to my YouTube channel with the thousands of comments over the years of people going, Phil, I had no idea that my guitar was supposed to be adjusted. Wow. What a difference. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I can't take credit for that. There's tons of YouTube channels making content like that, but I'm just saying, I'm just one of a, of a pile of people who, who illustrate it. Um, so, so there you go. So yes, uh, Patrick. Patrick says, hey, Phil, I was wondering uh, for a rare guitar like the PV Wolfgang, what's a good way to find a good selling price? I'm seeing everything at one to three K. Yeah, especially even the, the Korean ones. Again, uh, uh, again, this week when I said uh, when I said I got the um, the uh, the uh, access, we were talking about that with a buddy and he was saying, uh, well, the PV ones are going for like a grand to fifteen hundred dollars. And I said, yeah, for the Korean ones. And he's. I said, which is crazy for them. And I said, that's what the American ones were last year. And he went and looked. He goes, no. Oh, my God. He's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so um, what's a good selling price? Look, it's stupid. 
It's stupid what everybody's asking. I think somebody has one just like my PB Wolfgang on reverb right now. I think they're asking like 28. I can tell you right now, I don't want to sell it. If I was to sell mine though, I paid 14. A year ago, I'd been happy if I wanted to sell it to get 14. Because when I bought mine, they I thought they were worth about 12. Remember I was talking about overpaying for something? That one, it didn't have the original case, but it was the right weight because the guy weighed it for me. He was in, in Nevada, and it was the right color. Everything about it I wanted, hardtail, and um, he wanted 15 or 16. I got him to take 14, but I thought it was worth 12. But for the 200 bucks, you know, it's exactly what I wanted, so I bought it. Now, of course, you know, people are asking crazy prices. I What do I think? I think it's worth now in current market if I was going to sell it. If I was going to list that guitar... At 18 to 2 grand. I know at 18 it would sell too fast. It would sell in five minutes. I think at 2 grand it would take a you know a couple of days. Um, I think that's a little over what it's valued, you know, or worth, but I think that's what it'd go for. So um, what I will tell you, Patrick, about this is again, remember what you're dealing with. You're dealing with COVID, slow demand, or high or sorry, high demand, and Eddie passed away, so that drove everything crazy. Trust me on this. Find a dealer that has one used. The the the, the dude the, the personal buyers they're just too attached to it. They know what it's worth or and or they want more than it's worth because of all these reasons. Um, um, that access, Sam Ash, uh, they are a store and they make money not by selling a guitar. They make money by selling a bunch of guitars. So when I talk to them. They were willing to make me a deal. Why? Because it's one more guitar sold today. No one would have gave me the deal. I can tell you right now, for a fact, with no exceptions, no one would have gave me the price on that guitar on the mar on the used market. A person, only a store. Every person would have go looked at it as uh, Sam Ash literally looked at that guitar, and I already know because I talked to the manager at the store in uh, in Florida where I bought it. They literally looked up what they paid for it. And then said, okay, here's how much we're willing to sell it for. That's the minimum profit we'll take for the guitar. And they sold it to me. They used money, math. How much money are we willing to make or lose? Done. Deal. Sold customer. But a person would have said, oh, I know. Like the manager would go, look, man, these are going for blah, blah, blah in the used market. He just said, this is what we're into it for. This is what we can sell to you if you really, you know, if you're willing to buy it right now. Yeah, I'm willing to buy it right now. Um, Travis says, just how good are the Gretsch electromatic guitars? Is it good? Is it a good buy? Or is there a better option at the same price? Um, I like electromatic. That's my, I like the streamliner series too, by the way, but the electromatic stuff, especially the ones made in Korea, uh, in the mirror factory are fantastic. Um, I had a green one on my channel forever and ever and ever, and I sold it. And, um, and, uh, I, the reason I had it, I told you guys this before. In fact, if you watch the history of my channel, I've had like three Japanese Gretsches and I, and I ended up selling them and getting Electromatic. I love the Electromatic. I currently have a, a main Japan Gretsch right there. And no exaggeration, I only own that guitar because I got a smoking deal on it. Silly deal. It's a collector's piece because it's rare or rarer. And for the price I was into it, uh, the price I'm into that was not much more than the Electromatic. Not a whole lot more. Um, so, no, I, I love Electromatic guitars. Uh, but other options for the same price? I don't know. Is D'Angelico in that same price point? They're good guitars. I like the Eastwood stuff too as well. Obviously, I did an interview with them, but I like their stuff. And so, you know, that's a fair, that's a fair, uh, uh, fair uh, comment because I, I'm friends with the Gretsch guys and the Eastwood, Eastwood guys. So I like them both. Michael says, finally pulled the trigger on an Epiphone Lizzie Hale. Oh, yeah, I did that Explorer review. I, I, I'm not saying that's why you did it, but I'm saying I, I got to play one too. Um, as your comment moved. <laughs> okay, it says, all right, so Explorer, while watching right now, asked, uh, got $100 off Sam Ash. So he said, basically, just pulled the trigger literally while watching the show on a Lizzie Hale Explorer. While watching the show, he asked and got $100 off Sam Ash. Easy, just ask. Thanks. Reminder, here's the, uh, here's, Here's a reminder tip. So, perfect. Again, like I said, there is no deal on the internet that beats the phone call or the email or the talking with somebody in person. Look, man, everybody wants to make money. I, I've been in this business for many years. It's you gotta. It's flipping units, making money, make money. You gotta make the money, pay the bills, make the money. 
So letting somebody know you're not full of crap and you're ready to buy and giving giving a salesperson or a business owner the opportunity by saying, if you do these things, I'm a buyer. Now, sometimes if your ask is just crazy, well then, you know, that's you on you. <laughs> but in most cases, I always try to, I try to calculate it. Um, what I can tell you is that's not from experience. That's just me as a person. So you can do the same thing. I go, what do I think they'll take? That's not going to piss them off. Because that's what I'm looking for. Everybody's different. But me personally, I'm looking for the offer that I can say to somebody that doesn't end with, screw you. <laughs> right? If you want to put that offer out there, it's hard to move that needle once you do that. Somebody's like, you know, $2,000. And I'm like, well, see if they'll take a 1000 You're, you're going to end badly. <laughs> I'll give you 1000 Great. They're, they're, they're going to be like, here's where that response always gets you. I'll do 1999. Cause then now they're just pissed. So you gotta figure it out. And the only thing I will tell you is I've learned again, all of us has learned from negotiating. If they answer fast, you were probably not you're as aggressive as you want should have been. So I learned from each time over the years. So if I say 1600, like done. I'm like, oh, I should have did 14. 16's answer was too fast. <laughs> all right. Uh Okay, so Alex, Alex says, Phil, do you have any recommendations experience for eight string base? Oh, with eight string bases, I'm looking at a Schecter. Whoa, there it goes. Re uh, Riot 8, Stilato 8, as well as ESP. Thanks for all you do. I had the Riot 8 string base in black because, uh, I, of course, I wanted, I had it for a few years. I wanted to pretend I was in King's X. Uh, I just didn't, uh, I pretended I had the base. I just didn't have the talent. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's why I got it because I wanted King's X. Uh, some people usually want it for the like the uh, cheap trick kind of sound too, but I want it for King's X. Um, but yeah, so confirmation. I hope uh, yes. I the ESP ones. I'm sure it's good. I've never tried it or never played personally played it. I played both the Schecters. Stiletto Eight is neck through. It's kind of nicer, more premium. Maybe that's the way to go. Uh, but I didn't. You know, I was happy with my riot. It was legit the whole way. All, the, all you care about on a base like that is you just need a quality company that makes a quality neck because that amount of tension and that wackiness, you want that. You need that action to be nice. That's a lot of that's a lot of force, those two strings to push down. It's not impossible, but it's a little bit... It's It feels nicer on your finger because it spreads it out, but it's a little bit more push. Um, Jeff says, thank you for the advice on the Glary GST. Mine came with a small wood knot just inside the truss rod hole. Looks cool. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, you know what the Glary guitars are like? Random. <laughs> it's like you're going to get... It, it's... it's um When I was a kid... <laughs> when I was a kid... Anyway, I'm going to go ahead with it. When I was a kid, the, the local corner store, what they did is they took all the candy that they couldn't sell, all the crap they couldn't sell, and they put them in grab bags. So they literally sold them as grab bags. They were like 50 cents. And you could buy this little grab bag. And it was like a bag. And this, it was like, my, ours were colorful bags, like paper bags. And they stapled them. And you pay 50 cents and you get all this crap. And it was mostly crap. But to kind of sell it, right, to make sure you came and got another one, they'd put a couple of cool things in there. And every once in a while, you'd open up and they like, got the right thing. Glary is like the grab bag of the guitar world. You, you go open that box of Glary, it's either going to be way better than what you ever anticipated a $75 guitar to be, or it's going to be horrific. Uh, I know because I've talked to so many of you about the ones you bought and the experiences you had. It's not 50-50 because if it was, I would never talk about them again because it, that would be horrible. But I, I really feel like it's 20-80. 80% of you are like, I can't believe this, Phil. Thank you for the suggestion. And 20% of you are like, man, this was bad. So, And I and I hope, again, I'm conveying that in those uh, uh, videos that it's about repairs. It's about messing with stuff. But sometimes you get lucky, but sometimes you don't. Uh, and if you don't get lucky, you know, you buy it on Amazon, you should be protected. If you're not, I would contact them because that's another reason why I suggest them. If the Glary sold direct off their website, I don't think I trust as much. Uh, I usually reference you guys to the Amazon. Hope that helps. Uh, Ed says, any thoughts on the Jazzmaster style tremolos? Uh, I'm building a dual P90 semi hollow kit and one and curious if they're any good. They're good. They're not my cup of tea. They're kind of fun. They're out there. Uh, me... Me personally, if I was building a Jazz Master for myself, I would put a Bigsby on it. I think that's cooler. It just depends. I don't think that bridge is a great design. I don't need to lock it. I don't like the lock and pin. Uh, the feel of it's kind of like Lucy, and that's kind of cool. It's like Lucy Goosey, but I like the Bigsby. So if you want, if you want to go with it, go with it. But you know, you're asking me, so yeah. 
Bigsby. <laughs> we do Bigsby. Uh, Will Shaver says, do you still love your custom shop strat? I'm a telly. I'm a telly or just bought a Dream Fender custom shop telly. Can't wait for it to arrive. Uh, well, I love my custom shop strat. It's behind me, the blue one. Or the per Did I say blue? I saw the blue guitar first. The copper strat behind me that I can't point to. So everybody listening, I'm pointing to a copper strat. I love it. But again, it's a rig system for me. My custom shop strat is custom made. I spec'd out every detail of that guitar. Not only the color, not only the type. I even spec'd out the wood on that guitar. That wood is not only alder, it's one piece of alder. There's no, it's not a two piece body. It's a one piece alder body. So it's one piece of alder, tight route uh, cavity control. So it's, uh, so I didn't even have them route big enough pools for the humbucker. So I had to route that later when I did it. <laughs> um, uh, quarter sawn burl maple neck, 12 inch radius fretboard. I spec the fret wire. I spec the, the, uh, the bone nut material. I spec the spurs of locking keys. Um, you know what I mean? The, the type of bridge. So, it, and that's back when you could do that. So, so I said, yeah, I love it, but that's my way of saying, yeah, I love it, but I want to tell you why it's not just cause it's custom shop Stratton. It plays great. That's a great way to reason to love it. But so, um, but I'm glad you got a custom shop telling you're happy because, I mean, it's obviously a great guitar. You'll be happy. I can't imagine you won't be. Tosh says, first live show I've been able to catch since opening my music store in Australia back in August. As it jumps. Every time I read, it jumps. I apologize for that. Tosh, it says, okay, so he opened up a music store in Australia uh, back in August. Feels great to be listening to Phil's wisdom again. That's awesome. I, congratulations on opening the store. Best of luck to you. Um, and like I said, uh, I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed it. It was a cool gig. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was a lot of things I like about it. To be honest with you, one of the things, over the years of doing the, the live show, I get that question all the time. Like, what do you miss from the store? And I always had a bad way of articulating. I've learned I've learned from that question. I've learned two things. So so Josh, oh, not Josh, <laughs> he jumped again. Travis, not even Travis. It lost your comment. Got to love this system. Tosh. Thank you. It's Tosh. Tosh, two things I'll give you uh, some insight on. Two things I, I miss about my store. And so embrace those two things if you if they matter to you. One, I got to touch as much gear as I want. That was really nice. I miss that. Not just specifically being able to pick a piece of gear and try it. It was just all the random stuff that would come in. You get to try stuff. So I miss that. So enjoy that. Whatever comes in your store, new or used, enjoy it. And almost all of my friends, other than Ralph, who I've known since you know I was 19 or 20, all my friends that I currently have are from my store. I mean, you know, really, I mean, actually no exaggeration to that. I have so many friends uh, from that store, from meeting people every day. I met so many people and became close friends with them. Because everybody who comes to your store loves music. And that's great. What a great thing to have in common with somebody immediately. Now we're at the, the, the pinnacle of this, the end of the show. Doby Doss. <laughs> what is Doby Doss? By the way, Doby. If you're still watching, if not, I'll timestamp this and send it to you. Dude, man, working out. Jeez. Anyone, obviously, you're all fans of Dobie Doss. He's got a huge channel, but man, that guy, woo! And COVID, when COVID came, a lot of us were like, we're going to eat donuts and chocolate and gain 20 pounds. Dobie's like, I'm going to gain 20 pounds of muscle <laughs> on each arm. I'm just saying, congratulations, buddy. That's uh, that's uh, that's a lot of work. You can tell when somebody's working like you are. That's work, man. You you are hitting the gym, and you just got married. You know you don't have to care anymore, right? I hope your wife doesn't hear this, but you don't have to care anymore. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, will I be at Summer Nam 2020? I didn't even know until just now. There is there a Summer Nam? The last I heard, the place that they hold Summer Summer Nam was like some kind of triage hospital for COVID. That's no exaggeration. That was true. It says also, what are your thoughts on in-person NAM and room and rumors that there will be longer? They will be larger this time to compensate for the lack of winter NAM 2021. 
Uh, okay, so great question. Uh, will I go to Nam? I have no idea. I literally, like I said, just like uh, like five seconds ago, I just found out there's n summer Nam from you. So, um, and, and in COVID, I don't like to make a plan more than thirty days in advance because you know. So that's the first. That's my first thing. So uh, that's what my thought on that. Uh, rumors that it'll be larger. I don't know. You know what it is. I I think personally. It's it's a 50-50 shot on what you guess right now. Your guesses are simple. A, guess A. As soon as there's events like that, people are going to come in droves because we've just been trapped. We're all cabin fevered, right? We're just like all literally just hiding in a house. How do we get out and get around people? B, no one's going to want to go around people. <laughs> so that's the question. Um, now that I know there is one, I'll tell you what I would do. I, in this case, I think I would, uh, I, for, for safety of friends and family, I'd have to look at getting the shot. See, the thing with the shot is I don't know much about them. I literally know nothing about it. And the reason is, is because I work from home and I stay home. And my interaction with customers is, you know, like very limited, you know, limited. I have limited interaction with people right now. I've had very limited interaction with people uh, as a whole. So um, nothing has made me want to uh, get the shot because I figure there's so many people that need it ahead of me. You know what I mean? So it's not something I even put thought into. And I don't, I don't care what everybody's beliefs are, pro or against the shots. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you, I haven't even put thought into it because it's, again, it's not something I thought I had to think about. Uh, learning that there's a summer NAM and it's a potential thing, I would have to then see about maybe getting something like that, maybe something for safety or something. So to answer your question is, uh, I just found out about it from you and I'm, I'm curious now. I'll be looking into it more after the, after I get off the air. And, um, and, uh, look, I'm, I'm like a lot of you. I'm missing people. I'm, I'm missing everybody. I, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm, I miss Dovey. <laughs> you know what I mean? I miss bumping into people. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I trying to say I feel, almost feel like I'm speechless right now just because, like I said, it's, it really hits you when you realize like you're isolated. I hope that's what uh, I think that's why I like these live shows. I think Dovey doing concerts live. I think it's cool. I think this has been the connection I've needed through COVID. I hope it's the connection you guys needed. I don't want to end on a bummer, but that's kind of that. Maybe that's not a bummer. We have each other. Thank God for the Internet. Because <laughs> without it, it would just be staying at home. It would suck. So. Um, but I will find out more about it. On that note, it's not the last question because, again, I can't end on a bummer note. So, And not that it was a bummer, just I don't want to end on that note. So let's find one last guitar thing to talk about. Um, was Tyler here as well, too? I see Music is Win. Somebody said, thank you for surviving. Oh, he was. Party at my house at Music Win. Well, Tyler, you got COVID. <laughs> so I think you're safe. By the way, I'm happy you're you're well and safe now, by the way. Uh, as, 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 uh, you know, obviously see, like I said, we got to find a guitar thing to talk about, but yes, I would, I, I'm like already like in this, I'm thinking, man, I want to go. I want to go. Sounds already fun. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I know. Um, Mr. Tudor, you'll be the. Tudor? Yeah, Mr. Tudor 007 will be the last question of the day. It says, did I work with Dane from Zim's Guitars? So Dane at Zim's Guitars, if you guys don't know Zim's Guitars, he's in Mesa, Arizona. He's got a little guitar shop there. Uh, and uh, uh, so check it out. Uh, Dane was a customer at my store. So uh, literally that's, I guess, remember I told you all my friendships came from people at the store. Dane was a, a, a person who came to my store. He bought guitars, but he also bought and flipped guitars, right? So he was doing both, you know, sometimes for him, sometimes. I think one time I sold him a, a, a Strat Highway 1 that was supposed to be, like he saw an opportunity because I had like a smoking deal on it. I think he bought it to flip it, but I think he ended up keeping it for a while or keeping it forever. I don't remember. But so that's where he came. And then he, he decided to open a store. I want to think because I think I I want to I want to think because I made it look fun. <laughs> it wasn't. It was work. <laughs> but I made it look like it was not work, which is a good 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 skill to have, I guess, if you can do it. Uh, so then he opened a store. Uh, I want to say in 2016. That sounds about right because I think he opened it like 2016. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry, Dane. If it was 2015, um, and then we closed the shop in April of 2017 because that was the end of that for the for doing YouTube and just doing repairs now. Um, and so, 
Uh, and then whenever I get a chance, he's kind of like the store I'll go to because I know him from. And I go to Milano's too. Music. If you're in the area, there's stores I go to because I I know the Milano's people, so I go say hi to them and go check out gear and buy some stuff. And I go to Danes and buy stuff. Um, I try to to frequent the guitar centers a little bit, but I, I I you know it's not nothing against the guitar centers. I'm just I own a small business. I want to promote. I want to promote small business, but I want to go to small business. So if I can, um, what I buy from it was just in Dane's store. What I buy? I bought an overrated special from him. Oh, you know what I bought? I bought a 19... He'll probably he'll remember better. I, th I bought a 1984 Tube Screamer from him just recently. So he had in the case. And I was like, oh, I think I need that for some reason. So I have a vintage, I guess, 1984 Tube Screamer. So that's how I know Dane and that's how I know Zims. And that's why I try to help... Uh, when I did some videos for him on the channel, promote him stuff. Because um, it's a hard gig, man. I'm owning a small business. It's all work. And some play. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. Yeah, we did two and a half hours. That was fun. I still have a voice. <laughs> um, Adrian uh, did a super chat. Oh. Oh, he's saying, please review my Fender subsonic baritone. I'd have to know where you are. The problem, Adrian, right now is shipping is a nightmare. So, so well, <laughs> we're never going to end. This channel, this show will just go on forever. Uh, for those hanging out at the end, let me tell you what's going on right now that's horrible out there. So I, I told you guys I sent a gift to Germany, and um, they, they got lost. Well, after in November, I sent it November 3rd, in no, I think, or maybe it arrived there November 3rd. I think it arrived there November 3rd. It showed up at my house yesterday. No explanation why. The whole package. So at least I'm not out the package, um, but it it that that's crazy. The... Sam Ash guys, as a courtesy to me, because I know Sammy Ash, they overnighted this guitar. I don't know that to be true. The owner, the, the store manager could just overnight it, but I kind of got the vibe, like maybe because he's like, oh, you know, because later we told him, like, I know the owner. <laughs> so they overnighted this guitar. They overnighted this guitar on February 16th. Now, I remember there was a snowstorms. So I understand that. On February 19th, it was in Tennessee. So it took three days to get to Tennessee. And then it showed up on Wednesday this week. So it was overnight. They get no refund, by the way. Uh, uh, my wife actually called Sam Ash to let them know that it took two over two weeks to get here and that they should contact FedEx and get some kind of compensation for the fact that they paid probably about $150 to overnight it. And they let her know that they because of COVID, FedEx can't won't compensate you if they don't if they fail to meet the deadline. So uh, that's what I'm telling you is I'm a little nervous right now having stuff shipped. I just shipped a guitar back to a customer and I'm shipping another one to uh, for repair for repair customers and I've been parceling them out slowly because it's been a little scary shipping out there right now. So that's my long way of saying uh, if you want me to do a video of your guitar and you have to ship it to me, we definitely have to talk because I'm just it's a lot of you know shipping back and forth. It's just a lot of creepiness right now um, because uh, yeah. That makes me nuts. Okay, on that note, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me uh, as a, a long podcast. Uh, we hit a high number today. I think we had 1,300 people. And more importantly, we had like everybody that's cool on the cha and on YouTube channels from from Amanda Combs, Coombs. Sorry, Coombs. I don't know if I saw Ben Coombs. I think he might be, you know, man, to tell your brother, I think he was the only YouTuber I didn't see on the channel today. <laughs> and if I didn't see him, I'm sorry, Ben. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. As always, I want to thank you so much for your time. And until next week, know your gear.